from the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening or good morning, as the case may be across all these many sparkling time zones from the Hawaiian and Tahitian Island chains in the west, eastward, all the way across this great land to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, morning in the islands, south into South America, north to the pole, this is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell. Well, all right. I have a little bit of news, some announcements. Nothing but good news, really. I would like to announce that the first of the new radio surveys are coming in. And we are number one in Los Angeles, California. And the other survey that came in is San Diego. And was there ever any doubt? It took about a book, book and a half. KFMB, KFMB 760 in San Diego. Now, in this time slot, as in Los Angeles with this time slot, an overwhelming, overwhelming number one. So I want to thank everybody in Los Angeles and San Diego, I guess all of Southern California, for the number oneness. I mean, it wasn't even a close contest. <laughs> so that's good news. On another note, as you may hear, I'm going to kind of struggle through it. I, I may have... Uh, I don't know, a cold or the heebie-jeebies or something is trying to get me. So uh, I took a day off yesterday, but I'm back today, and actually I feel pretty good. Uh, but it may be a struggle. All right. I just got a note uh, moments before airtime from Ed Dames. The following. Hi, Art. Ed asked me to give you this message. He is currently on the Hawaiian Islands working and conducting uh, what he calls SciTech's most important project. He would like to break the news about it to the public on your show. The date, which would be the most convenient for him, is Thursday, January 30th. He'll be in L.A. then. If you'd like to make this definite, please let us know. It'll be put on Ed's schedule. I have done that. So there you are, Ed Dames, with something really hot, which he will break here Thursday the 30th. Tonight, I've got something very special for you. His name is Dr. Barry Taff. He was a guest on Dreamland. He was the principal investigator on the case, the, uh, well, what, parapsychological case that later became known as the Entity Case, and uh, it was a movie by the same name, The Entity. When he was on Dreamland, he told me of some photographs of the real Entity Case and some others that at the time seemed hard to believe. I said, you have photographs? He said, yes. Uh, so I said, doctor, how about sending them along? Well, he did. He did. You're about to hear of these cases in a few moments. Uh, but uh, if you want the documentation, the photographs, that will go with what you're about to hear, then you need to get up to my webpage pronto and take a look. The address is www.artbell.com. That's www.artbell, no space, A-R-T-B-E-L-L, -L, dot com. Take a very good look. And if that doesn't put one big chill down your spine, I don't know what will. And we will describe these photographs. So if you can make your way to a computer tonight during the show, you're going to definitely want to take a look. And I will tell you more about Dr. Taff in a moment. Uh, Dr. Barry Taff, 48, 
now, earned his doctorate in psychophysiology with a minor in biomedical engineering from UCLA. He holds six medical patents, is currently the CEO of an R&D medical company developing these patents for the market. From 1969 through 1978, he worked out of the former parapsychology laboratory at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute as a research associate, where he studied telepathy, precognition, remote viewing, as well as poltergeists, hauntings, doppelgangers, and UFOs. Dr. Taft's research has been published in numerous journals, periodicals, magazines, and books over the last 25 years. Over the last 28 years, he has been the principal investigator on more than 3,500 cases of poltergeists and hauntings, of which became one of which became the best-selling book and motion picture, The Entity, starring Barbara Hershey. That was on Fox in 1983, or by Fox. He also investigated numerous local CE3 and abduction cases, one of which involved his own girlfriend in 1977. He's been on all kinds of TV and radio programs, and now he's on this one. Dr. Taft, welcome to the program. Oh, pleasure to be here, Art. Great to have you. And, um, of, of course, there is a great deal of audience here that did not hear your appearance on uh, Dreamland. Mm -hmm. And when you sent me those photographs, um, it took a while, but it was worth the wait, because when they went, they got here, I went, Holy mackerel! <laughs> Holy mackerel! So, I'm urging people to go take a look, which they are presently doing, you can be sure. And I guess I would like to, uh, I, I ought to first ask you, why you pursued the line of inve investigation you obviously have, in other words, uh, the paranormal. Why? Well, I think... Initially, it was one of pure scientific curiosity. Um, I've always been curious about nature, about why events occur, why things don't occur. But I think what really drove me into it was, as I was growing up as a child, I had what people would commonly call psychic experiences, and they were quite profound and intense, and they were very frequent, telepathic, um, precognitive, out of body, and my friends and family weren't having them. So I was left with the, with the thought of, well, Either I'm crazy, everyone else is crazy, or something very peculiar is going on. Did, I chose the latter. Did they think you were crazy? In other words, did you tell them about this? Oh, I told them and demonstrated at the times, uh, uncontrollably, unconsciously. And I didn't know what was going on, nor did anyone else. And I think the most common response was one of fear. Because, in, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, this wasn't very well known or talked about in, in public mainstream. People are, uh, well, look, it's still true today. People are afraid of what they cannot understand. Correct. Simple as that. Um, so you began actually having your own experiences, mm -hmm. and then uh, I guess you, psych, uh, psychophysiology. Right. Um, explain that. Well, Psychophysiology is the study of the interrelationship between the brain, the mind, the brain, and the body. Mm -hmm. It's a, another way to get into medicine without going to medical school because you don't have to. You learn a lot of the same information, but it's more towards function than towards diagnosis and, and prescription. So uh, my interest was, uh -huh. since I was having all these peculiar experiences, I want to learn as much as I could about the brain, uh, how it functioned, the behavior related to that, and the body in which, in which you know, held the brain. All right, I tried asking um, another uh, doc doctor we had on the other, uh, I think at the beginning of the week, about the brain. How much do we actually know about the function of the brain? How much of the brain has been mapped, and are there areas we still don't understand properly, or wh how far have we come? Well, we, we've learned a great deal over the last 30 years, the amount of information learned all the way from just simple EEGs to magnetic encephalographs, which are MEGs. And now we have CAT scanners and we have um, MRIs and we have PET scanners. And so now we can look at the functioning of the brain in real time, and we've learned what parts of the brain are responsible for 
you know, what parts of the uh, locomotion, uh, internal processing, uh, metabolic function, things like that. But we, in terms of thought and processing of thought, we're still at the tip of an iceberg. Hmm. Um, it's sort of like for every cell that fires, there are numerous cells around that one cell that don't fire. It's called lateral and surround inhibition. So when people, you know, euphemistically say, well, you know, we only use 10% of our brain. If we used our entire brain at any given instant, we would die from electrocution. Because the insulation around every cell would be negated, and we would, you know, we basically would short circuit. Is there any reason to believe that um, for those who embrace the process of evolution, most of the scientific community, that we are using any more of our brain today than we did when we first began studying the brain? Well, without having technology around the time where we were first utilizing our, you know, human functions our cerebral functions, there's no way of knowing. Um, I assume that the brain has gone through some changes, you know, as hominids evolved into various primitive, um, you know, humans, and then we evolved into what we have now as homo sapiens. But um, I think we've changed possibly from, you know, the environment, which would be environmental, and we've uh, changed also from a physical environment. In other words, we've evolved at a physiological level. We've evolved because our environment has forced us to change. So we might have lost certain functions we possessed as primitive human, and we probably gained things we didn't possess as primitive human. A trade-off. Right. Um, they have studied people like Einstein, uh, I'm sure. Uh, they took. Did they not examine Einstein's brain? I remember reading something about that in yeah. the past. Yeah. Uh, Einstein and others that have exhibited um, abnormally high IQs or intelligence uh, are they able to find any physical differences in the brains of these people? I've never read of anything that's really that specific, that state specific enough to say that there were more uh, synaptic connections or there were more binding receptors or mm. certain lobes were more, were, were, uh, had a denser amount of dendrites or axons. No one knows. I mean, it's, um, I think that the, when we deal with intelligence, we have a very difficult uh, time explaining it because there's different types of intelligence. There's rote memory, which is the ability to acquire information and spit it back, which is what school is all about. Then there's an emotional type of IQ, which is being able to synthesize and integrate information mm -hmm. and then throw out new things that you didn't learn based on what you did learn. And so there's different types of process. And you have things, uh, situations, people, idiot savants who can do incredible things, but only uh, one or two things, while, you know, very simple cognitive processing, they can't do. All right. Well, then it's very difficult to measure intelligence, because there are a lot of people who have done absolutely lousy in school. Rote memory, very little. Uh, concentration, interest, very little. Grades, very poor. And yet, when they get to be adults, they become great entrepreneurs and make millions and millions of dollars or go on to some other form of, of greatness. Uh, so there seems very little relationship between uh, uh, what is done in school and then what may be done later. Sometimes there, I guess there is a relationship, obviously. You do well in school and you go on and do well in life, but not always, huh? Well, also look at the people in the arts. I mean, not all of them were scholars or... Right. Uh, scholastic academicians, right. and they sometimes these people evolve into wonderful artists in different fields, and we know so little about what makes each of us unique and gives us the potential we all have. And I think as time goes on and we are able to do non-invasive, real-time processing of information within the nervous system and you know the brain, we're going to understand more of this. But it's probably going to take a couple more decades before we really have an understanding of. What sparks that light within each of us? Do you think we are further along in the mapping of the human genome or the brain? Um, probably the genome at this point, hmm. because there's more money being spent on it. And since you're working with something that's sort of, you know, in, uh, in vivo, that's you know, that that's not connected to the body, we can work with it with more freely and greater independence than you can with a living person, you know, in an MRI or a CAT scanner. All right, let's now talk about things parapsychological, things that uh, the ability to move things, levitate things, control things, um, uh, the ability to uh, read somebody's mind or even put thoughts into the mind. All these areas of parapsychology, including the poltergeist and all the rest of it, 
Are you able to look at the brain and see any different area at all of function when these things apparently are going on? The only thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is with regard to there are altered states of consciousness that are intimately associated with certain types of paranormal phenomena, such as controlled, what we call PSI, PSI, let's say telepathic, clairvoyant, or precognitive situations in laboratories. They've seen altered states, uh, which are what one might call hypometabolism or wakeful rest, where the person's in a very quiet state of rest and relaxation, but their mind is really quite active at one level, but quiet at another. This would be um, suggested by a high, uh, a high uh, density of alpha activity in certain uh, regions of the brain. Um, the respiration is slowed down. Blood pressure drops. GSR basically goes, um, goes down. Hmm. And all of this relates to an altered state that seems to be more conducive to the control manifestation, let's say telepathy or precognition, or remote viewing, where the body is totally passive and the mind sort of shuts out cognitive processing and is allowed to access information that isn't within itself normally. Uh, you heard me read an announcement about Ed Dames. He's got something big he's working on. He was a military remote viewer. Mm -hmm. um, I take it that you have studied, uh, to some degree, remote viewing. Yes. Uh, how much is there to it, do you believe? Well, it's sort of like the rest of, the, of what we call paranormal phenomena. When it works, it works very well, but it fails a good percentage of the time. And the biggest problem with evaluating re remote viewing information, as with all this area, is to understand that there's a lot of noise in the system. Um, for every time you succeed, you fail several times beyond that. And oh, the best way to, to say it is that it's a very imperfect means of acquiring information. Okay, uh, but... And you have to be able to ve objectively verify the information you're perceiving. So uh, when the government got all caught up with this in the 70s, mm -hmm. um, if they conduct the, when they conducted these experiments, you have to go out and verify this information to make sure that it correlates to events in the real world. Otherwise, it's fantasy and, you know, uh, confabulation. All right. Here's what I've heard about the process of remote viewing, that a target is assigned, not by name, for example, but with a random number. I've never quite understood how that worked, but it is given to many, as many, say, as eight remote viewers, completely separated from each other, and then they come back and many times will give exactly the same either written description or photograph or you know whatever the target was they'll come back with the same information yes. um, that seems to be a discipline that has been applied to remote viewing that has not been applied to other areas of um, a parapsychology or, or abnormal occurrences in other words they've developed some sort of discipline well, we found the same when we were doing our sort of initial exploratory work in this area back in the uh, the end of the 60s and early 70s, which the, much of the uh, government of the DOD's work was based on. Um, we found the same thing occurring: uh, independent corroboration coming in coming in within a controlled environment, and it was quite fascinating. But we also found we got independent corroboration or convergence, and many times it was wrong. The information was totally, you know, fallacious. Now that is interesting independent results right. saying the same thing almost identical sometimes verbatim identical and verbatim but being wrong right which means we all for some reason locked into the same inaccurate or incorrect information yikes first time i've ever heard that one doctor hold on we'll be right back to you my my guest is dr barry taff and uh you just wait till you hear some of the stories he's got to tell. Thought I'd ask about the brain first. I am Art Bell, and this is CBC. Call Art Bell toll-free 
southwest of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. You bet it is. Good morning. My guest is Dr. Barry Tenth. And he is a very, 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 very interesting individual. He has studied about 3,500 cases of weirdness, poltergeist, hauntings, that sort of thing. And he's done it uh, uh, professionally. Uh, at uh, UCLA, the UCLA lab, and uh, so what you're going to hear tonight, I suggest you pay very close attention to. A couple of more questions on remote viewing coming up, because I am fascinated by that, particularly what we're talking about right now. Dr. Barry Taff. Doctor, I'm absolutely fascinated by remote viewing, and to hear that sometimes eight... Remote viewers, or however many, come back with the identical wrong result would imply, I guess, either that the remote viewers are affecting each other or the control for them is affecting the remote viewers, uh, the control being the man assigning the random number for the um, a target, or a, a completely outside force is affecting what they receive. Which one of those theories would you lean toward? Uh, the information that we gathered didn't lean toward any direction, one direction or the other. It just told us that there were times when everyone locked in on precisely the same information. And what's, what's bizarre is that we could never tell beforehand when this was going to occur and until we you know, evaluated the results of each particular session. We had no way of knowing what we were dealing with. But sometimes that information was more precise um, and had a higher degree of convergence than when it was accurate. So we didn't understand. It just told us that the process involves an aspect of consciousness, consciousness we know nothing about. I mean, no one knows anything about this. It's, and it's pre locking into information at a remote set of, co set of coordinates. How we get to that, God only knows. I mean, with all the controls and the uh, protocol and the experiments that have been conducted over the years, the mechanism still isn't understood. I Here, mean, here's an idea. Um, I would suspect the control, uh, the person who is the controller for the remote viewers, the one who assigns the random number. Now, now, that person, I think, knows what the target is. Am I correct? Yes. All right. Uh, it is possible, is it not, to test somebody for PSI ability? Not with a degree of certainty. Now, there's no um, hard and true test that will guarantee results. There, are, you know, it has to be geared towards the individual. Uh, if you standardize testing, it's very boring and fatiguing, and you're not going to get results that are very promising. So, if you test the average person with these methods, you're not going to get results that are that impressive. At least well, that's what I've seen. That's too bad because I was going to suggest if you could. Um, I test somebody and get a very low PSI result, somebody with almost no inherent ability, uh, versus somebody with a very high PSA, a PSI result, a lot of inherent ability, I would think um, then trying both of those as controls for the remote viewers would be an interesting test. Well, what's bizarre along those lines is that we tried when we got these these independent sort of convergence on totally erroneous information. We tried to determine if that information correlated to anything involved in the experiment or any of the people participating in the in the program. It never did. It was like we sat, we all sat down and wrote the same script without even knowing we were going to be writing scripts. It was something along that line, and we never really saw any any connection to anything that could be traced down. It was almost like. You know, we all decided to imagine the same thing at the same time. Yeah. Which... Re remote viewers claim varying degrees of success. Many of them claim high degrees of success, maybe too high. What do you think? Is there any claim that, that, that you can validate? Well, it, 
it varies depending on the people you're working with and depending on the, the situation. We've seen, we saw sessions where we were getting almost 100% accuracy. Uh-huh. We saw other sessions where it was zero. zero. And the only variable we saw that affected performance in a longitudinal sense, strangely enough, and this was looking backwards on the data, not, this was not with an a priori anticipation. The only thing that we saw that consistently produced a diminution of results across the board was the phases of the moon. The and those, phases of the moon? Yep. And we didn't anticipate it. We saw a drop in results that had a 28, well, almost a 29-day, you know, con, you know an, an even interval between the diminution. And we looked for what would correlate to it. The only thing that correlated to those consistent drops in performance was the presence of the full moon. How did it relate? Uh, we, when we, the full we, moon, during a full moon, it the, was... The drop, the performance diminished. Diminished? Diminished during the full moon. Did not, it did not, there was not a, uh, an equal and sort of opposite response during the new moon. We saw it during Santa Ana conditions with the positive ion uh, charge in the air. We saw a similar drops in performance, not of the same magnitude, but we saw drops in performance. Oh, and that's fascinating. We try to compensate for the Santa Ana conditions with, you know, negative ion generators and things of that nature. It didn't make much difference. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, do you think that remote viewing can be further developed? In other, in other words, with additional disciplines and whatever else they can do, that it can yet be improved even more? Oh, I think with the application of one particular technology... Uh, positron emission tomography is a form of scanning the brain where you, they inject a radioactive substance into the bloodstream at glucose, and when the brain metabolizes this, it, it gives you a very beautiful color scan that shows you what part of the brain is metabolizing to a greater or lesser degree in real time. To my knowledge, no one's done studies to see if remote viewers would show changes in certain areas of the brain if they're processing at a greater or lesser degree during this activity. If this could be done, and we saw consistent results that certain areas of the brain were overactive or underactive during this activity, we might know to reinforce that and thereby yes. increase the potential of the phenomenon or the performance of the phenomenon. Um, what does electroshock therapy do to a person? Well, it, it's sort of... The best way to describe it is you don't remember, even though you know you were getting e- ECT, you don't remember the experience. It's sort of in the simplest way of short circuits the brain temporarily and scrambles the activity in the brain. It's the simplest way of describing it. Is it almost like rebooting a computer? Mm, no, it'd be like sending a high-voltage <laughs> electrostatic discharge to the computer without destroying it. Oh, that's not such a good idea yeah. with computers, Doctor. <laughs> right. So that's the closest I could describe it. Um, you know, the, there's tremendous controversy over the application of ECT in any respect, and um, it's isn't it's, it kind of like slamming a fly with a hammer? No, well, it's like hitting a fly with a howitzer. <laughs> howitzer, uh, more appropriate. Um, oh, okay, from something like that, a blunderbuss approach to a more refined approach. In other words. The study you just talked about, uh, looking, for example, at a remote viewer in session and mapping the active areas of the brain and then individually attempting to uh, stimulate those particular areas of the brain. Could that be done? That's what I was suggesting. Once we know what, let's say we had 100 remote viewers done over a certain amount of time and let's say we saw consistent patterns of metabolic activity in a PET scan in each of them, and it only occurred during remote viewing activity or some sort of paranormal perceptual process, then could we somehow artificially reinforce or enhance that part of the brain or process of the brain, of course, safely, and see a dramatic increase in performance and more reliability. So with that process, it might be possible to eventually artificially cause parapsychological occurrences, uh, poltergeist activity, um, whatever else, the ability to... What, what have you ever seen anybody do, Doctor? Have you ever seen somebody move any object with their mind? Um, well, the most 
in, in uh, I guess, unique situation with regard to that was when Uri Geller visited the lab in 1975 at UCLA, and um, you would, we put him through some control situations. And um, you were there then? Oh yeah, we were there. Okay. And, uh, I was there, and we uh, he bent some keys, and the most impressive thing was not him holding a key and bending it, you know, someone else's key, but stroking the key, putting the key down where he wasn't even near it, and the key kept bending and broke independently of. You know, what? It, it, the, the key broke. Bro, it snapped, right. Mm -hmm. Snapped. Right. And that was impressive. And I guess, you know, like, anything could be faked. But um, with the, um, he did some other things there, but that impressed me because... Well, I would um, take it at UCLA, you would have fairly tight controls. I mean, some uh, I can't imagine a trick that could snap a key. Well, I can't either, but there have been debunkers that have made all sorts of claims. I mean, one person... One debunker actually made the claim that Geller had a high-powered laser hidden as one of his teeth, and he was oh, you know, for heaven's sake, you know, things of that nature. Um, that was impressive, but I've seen things in, in particular cases. I was I was investigating a um, a, uh, a poltergeist case in about ten, well, about ten or eleven years ago in the San Fernando Valley, and it was a doppelganger case where the the young girl, the young woman, apparently they were hearing her. Well, it started off where objects were moving around. Furniture, when she was young, was moving around. They heard things, people walking in the house. Doors were opening and closing. Um, toys were being moved around, various objects. Uh, machines were malfunctioning. And it got to the point to where the phone would ring, and they'd hear the girl on the phone. And it was her voice, but a younger version of her voice. And yet she wasn't on the phone. And they checked the phone lines and... These things kept happening, and the most impressive thing about this case, the girl happened to be epileptic. Now, when the seizures were occurring, the focal seizures were occurring, is when yes. the phenomena would kick up its heels. When the seizures, you know, wane, the phenomena would wane. Now, let me get this straight. The young girl was present, and the phone would ring. And they'd hear uh, her family, and I think her boyfriend at one point, picked up the phone and heard her talking on it. As a younger... Yeah, and she was responsive. It wasn't like a recording. Oh, and this happened more than once, to my knowledge. Oh, that really gives me the chills. You, you said she was responsive. Now, this goes to... I'm covering, trying to cover so much ground too quickly, but uh, the very nature of what a poltergeist or a ghost is, there are some people who think they're kind of echoes of what was or an occurrence something that did happen that is repeated again and again and again in some sort of horrible endless loop uh some sort of shadow of an original occurrence but that can't be well, if, this, if if there was responsiveness well, this situation was uh, a lot of these cases are suggestive that there's an intelligence behind it it's not just a uh, a feed, an audiovisual reconstruction of what you know came before, playing back and people observing it or uh, witnessing it. This, these situations um, strongly suggest that the phenomena is interacting with the people at a, you know on a microsecond level. And what's impressive is that the last time this girl uh, had any activity is when she went through a very intense trauma, and afterwards she the, the seizures came back, the epileptic seizures, as did the phenomena. So, and, and with everything, after the last time I appeared on your show, a number of people called, two men in particular, and they both appeared to be poltergeist agents, and they both were epileptic, and were both were on medication. The minute they started taking the medication to quell the seizures, the phenomena terminated. When they stopped taking the medication because of the side effects, the phenomena returned. What is going on uh, in our brains when we have an epileptic seizure? Um, massive surges of electrochemical activity, spiking, spindling, um, erratic behavior in which energy is being sort of discharged and emitted in a very chaotic, frenzied way as opposed to organized, which is what thought's all about. All right, then we'll come back to that. That causes me to ask you then, uh, you remember I mentioned electroshock therapy. Mm -hmm. Has anybody done any study uh, with regard to parapsychological uh, occurrences during electroshock therapy, would that be a reasonable avenue of investigation? Well, perhaps with the in potential harm to the patient would be so great, I don't think it would be worth the trade-off. Well, I know, but I mean, uh, you know, in some cases where they you know, they still do that right. therapy. I've never read, I personally have never read of any accounts of that occurring where, you know, psychokinesis erupted. And it can, of course, the... Um, it, it, the difference between normal or, I guess, unassisted 
chaotic behavior in the brain and induced through ECT might be two different things. Who knows if the, let's say, if you took a map, uh, a three-dimensional map of the brain's electrical activity during, um, let's say, a seizure versus an ECT thing, how similar they'd be. We don't know. I mean, if they'd be identical, that what what areas of the brain would be more affected than others? And also, uh, epilepsy sometimes is focused in certain areas of the brain, um, huh. certain loci versus others, while ECT generally is more of a generalized response. I, mean, I was just sort of picking up on the randomness of it, and I was wondering if there might be some sort of connection. And also, I think the person, you know, they have, they have to be strapped down because the body obviously would, would, would convulse during Sure. That. And uh, yeah, I've never heard of anything occurring, but... It, you know, there might be accounts on record, but I think people would be a little uh, shy to discuss it in medical environments. Uh, at the time all of this investigation was going on at UCLA, what was the attitude of the staff? Was it serious? Were the rest of the professors at the university uh, uh, laughing uh, at uh, uh, the parapsychology uh, lab? I th well, put it this way, the NPI didn't particularly care, the Neuropsychiatric Institute did not particularly care for what was going on. Uh, it, you know, it was a very serious, you know, academic environment, and uh, they were under scrutiny by government because the government helped fund the, you know, the, the NPI and private funding, huh. and they didn't particularly like, like it. It wasn't what they thought was science. They looked at it as anything other than science, maybe fringe science at best. Um, a lot of professors in different departments in neurology and physiology and um, uh, you know psychology were intrigued by it, but they were frightened that if they got too involved, it would be you know, it would be self injurious to their career. Careers, yeah. Now you're not going to throw away your career to get involved with something that you know isn't going to lead you anywhere except through personal exploration. And people had to consider that. And uh, the lab was uh, it was an interesting place because it was you know we we got thousands of calls every year for different types of phenomena. And people didn't know where to turn to. I mean, they were very, uh, they were uh, uh, at their wit's end in terms of who do you call. Because of the career-threatening nature of this sort of research, Doctor, how much private, even secret research do you think might be going on around the country now? Unpublicized, unrecognized, unpublished. Well, given that really good research, uh, if it's properly instrumented, costs enormous amounts of money, I'd say that it wouldn't be at, at, a, at a great level. There are, however, uh, people I know, and I will not mention any names, uh, with a very great deal of money who are funding investigations into, into these sorts of areas. I don't know where that money is going, but I do know it is, it, it is occurring. Oh, yes, I'm sure there's research going on all over the world. The thing is, a lot of institutions of higher learning, uh, wherever they may be, are more concerned about political correctness and not being cast out of that environment to get money. And if they are associated with this at a public level, they're dead in the water. And there's still that that that, that taint of, you know, what we had in the life of spiritualism, and people don't like it. Uh, what was interesting at the NPI, they were doing orbital undercutting and psychosurgery, you know, the late 60s and 70s. Right. That was okay, but God forbid you should do research into the nature of of our consciousness, you know, who we are, where we come from, where we're going, and what makes us us. That they, they weren't interested because what I discovered is the academic environment is governed by the ability to use information. If, well, if you can't make use of it to make money, control behavior, Yep. or to kill people, yep. it yep. doesn't seem to have any direct application in the real world. And I, thank God, most of the government's uh, attempt to utilize this phenomena to do any of the above didn't work that well. I acquiring information, yes. Controlling behavior, eh, not that well. Uh, killing people, uh, you had a better chance of uh, growing your hair back at 95. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. So... Uh, the idea of all kinds of people with uh, uh, psychic powers of one sort or another concentrating on saying bursting a blood vessel in Saddam Hussein's brain—that one's a no-go. Well, I don't think it's. I don't think the psychokinetic effect is cumulative. I don't believe that if you had 20 people working on it, you're going to get a better result than if you had one person. Uh -huh. Theoretically, if there was a person like an Uri Geller or whoever, or, or you know, some psychokinetic medium. Who could do that? There was um, um, uh, Nina Kolagina, the Soviet Union, who could induce severe electrical burns by just touching you. 
and could, um, you know, really types of unusual effects through psychokinesis. And she was put on film, and she was very well researched. Anybody, anybody who could snap a key could snap a blood vessel, I would imagine. Doctor, hold on. We're at the top of the hour. Relax. We'll be right back to you. Dr. Barry Taff is my guest. I'm Art Bell. This is CBC. Taking calls on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First-time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Across this great land, good morning, everybody. I'm Art Bell, and though I was down yesterday. I'm certainly not out. By the way, a whole bunch... You know that doll that somebody sent me, that cursed doll that we deposited in the trash can with a bunch of salt? A lot of people sent me faxes and said, see? See? That was it. Thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> God, that was weird. I'll tell Doc Taff about that. Anyway, listen, um... To repeat a couple of announcements, uh, the surveys are beginning to come in again, as they do several times a year, uh, and the fall survey is in, and in Los Angeles on KABC, in our time slot, we're number one. <laughs> uh, you're going to hear a lot of number one screaming this weekend, uh, important football coming down Sunday, so you'll hear a lot of that, number one. And guess what? In uh, San Diego, the survey has also come in, and in every single category, men, women, you know, you name the age, in this time slot, from 11 to 5, KFMB is way, way out number one. Number one, as they say. So thank you uh, to the people of Southern California. Way out number one. I mean, these are markets with 40 and 50 radio stations, and uh, we just ran away with it. At any rate, um, uh, I've got a very, very, very interesting guest, and I'll, I'll tell you about him. I know many of you are joining at this hour in a moment. I received a very interesting message from Ed Dames, who said he is in Hawaii at the moment, working on the most important project that SciTech has ever worked on and would like to be my guest January 30th, where he is going to break what he calls big news on this program. Mark it on your calendar. Uh, my guest is Dr. Barry Taff. For nine years, he worked with the parapsychology lab at UCLA on things strange. All kinds of strange occurrences. They investigated them, many, many of them, about 3,500 cases, as a matter of fact. And uh, actually, the majority of the cases, doctor, uh, came out to be not much, right? Well, most cases, you're, you're dependent on, as these are field investigations, you're dependent on being in the right place at the right time. The phenomenon sure. is... Not only is it transient in nature, it's elusive and evasive. Um, and if it come, if it's psychokinetic in origin, if it's stemming unconsciously from a per, one of the people living in the environment, there, your presence in itself is intimidating. Well, inhibiting, inhibitory, sure. and that turns it off. So I'd say it's very rare that you're present when something happens to either witness or to record anything. 
But so the majority of the cases, you interview the people, you take down a lot of information, you tape the interview, and you, you leave, and that's it. All right. But it did happen. All right. What we're about to talk about, uh, there are photographs on my website right now. Any of you with a computer, go to www.artbell.com. Right at the very top of the page, you'll see uh, a Dr. Taff. Click on that. It will take you to where the photographs are that we're about to talk about. Now, the uh, two movies that scared the tar out of me, Doctor, were The Exorcist and The Entity. And I think because both were based on reality. You were the principal investigator uh, on the case... Uh, that was later made into the movie called The Entity. Um, tell that story. Tell the real story versus what occurred. It, w was the movie close? Well, the movie was close, but as with, you know, the entertainment industry, they took dramatic license with it, which is, I guess, the nature. Of the, the book, of course, took dramatic license because when Frank DiFolito was writing the book, he said to me, um, if you had your druthers and had all the money in the world, what would you have done in this scenario? Right. And I said, well, we would have place the woman in a controlled environment and, tr and hope that the phenomena would occur there and then try to document it with the best instrumentation possible. Which, as I recall in the movie, is exactly what they did. Correct. Uh, they created her home in sort of a big sound stage, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, that did not really occur. No, that would have cost a fortune. And, uh, you know, what's interesting, what I wanted to say just from the last segment very quickly was that I, I believe that if we or any researchers had all the money they wanted, billions and billions of dollars, and all the time they wanted, I think what we'd end up with is knowing what the phenomena isn't. I don't think our technology is sufficiently developed or adequately developed to really put a handle on this. I think we're still investigating the yeah. effect of an unknown cause that operates through mechanisms we have the foggiest notion of. Do you think there ever will come a day this is speculation, of course, when we will figure it out. Perhaps, but I, it, w one of the reasons, and this is my own philosophy, one of the reasons I think we're not going to discover this in the immediate future, let's say in the next, oh, 75 or 100 years, what I'm being, you know, that's perhaps a pessimistic projection, mm -hmm. is that the knowledge gained is so potentially destabilizing in terms of society, um, we would tr make it into weapons. What, it, what did the military want with all this p p paranormal knowledge? They wanted to make weapons and countermeasures. With of course. It. And that's where everything goes. And if these ta if these abilities, these forces of nature, were turned into anti-personnel weapons, we'd all be dead by now. Well, surely if it could be proven that Uri Geller could snap a blood vein uh, in, a, in a brain as he could a spoon on a table, uh, they would have him locked up but good, wouldn't they? Well, you know what? Yeah, that's true. But you know what's intriguing? He he did. Uh, Uri Geller did have a conscience because the military uh, did, in fact, who, who sponsored some of the research on Geller, the Defense Department, they did, in fact, want to see if he could damage, you know, military weaponry and or personnel. And he he said if people were going to be harmed, he wouldn't do it. That's what that was his attitude back in the 70s, which shows a tremendous, you know, uh, level of sophistication. There may be people who might not have that control or inhibitory factor and just go out and do whatever they want um, as they do with a gun today. So, um, I, But I do think that if we ever unlock this force, um, we're not going to like what we see. I mean, that's my personal uh, judgment and feeling based on the experiences I've run into over the years. Well, like all forces, though, it could be used for good or evil. The problem is the Pentagon rarely has good on its mind. Well, the Pentagon exists to basically wage war. Yeah, but back right. to your original question, which was um, uh, about the entity case. Yes. Um, 1974, uh, my colleague was in a bookstore in Westwood in California here, Los Angeles, and he's talking to one of his friends about our work, investigating hauntings, poltergeists, etc. And a woman across the aisle, in the, in the, looking at books with a friend, she says, oh, excuse me, but my house is haunted. Um, he said, fine. And rather than talk about this in a public you know, environment, which would be disastrous for everyone. Sure. He said, let me take your name and your phone number, and we'll call you, make an appointment, come out to see you. Fine. Uh, about a week later, we go out to see her. She lived in Culver City, which is not far from Westwood, in a broken-down little shack of a house, three times, three times condemned by the city. Wow. Um, she had four children, um, one boy and three girls. 
little girl, um, we started interviewing her, and the first thing she told us is that she'd been repeatedly uh, raped or sexually accosted by the, this entity. Two, there were three of them, she claimed. Two would hold her down and one would attack her. And with hearing that, we both rolled our eyes back and thought, oh, my God, this woman, you know, is very disturbed and needs a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. uh, because we've never, other than, you know, legends and, you know, strange books, we've never done anything like that. Um, we, we thanked her for the interview and we left. And I almost stamped the form, the form we fill out, with a P, which suggests that they're, you know, they're psychologically unstable. Um, she called back a week later and said that some friends and neighbors had witnessed phenomena in the house. So we came back, and uh, while interviewing her in the kitchen, the lower cupboard door flew open, and a frying pan, a, a heavy skillet, flew out in a parabolic course and landed across the room. You saw that happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. And we checked the, the cupboard, the cabinet, for anything, or springs or whatever, and the ropes, wires, there were none. Uh, we picked up the pan. It was very normal. And uh, I should say that upon entering the house initially and on the second visit, we were... Well, we, the house had a peculiar smell to it, it like a rotting uh, smell of rotting or decomposing organic matter. Very foul stench was, was quite intense. Huh. Uh, also, we, this was the middle of August of 1974. It was very hot, and the house was cold. Yet the windows were open, and why was it not cold? Warm? Why was it cold? The bedroom was particularly cold, which apparently was the loci, the, the focus of the phenomena went into the bedroom and it felt like it was refrigerated. All right, now there is something that one would think you could measure. I mean, take a, you know, a thermometer and take it into the bedroom and have another one outside. The windows are open. No, temperature didn't register. The only uh, real instrument reading we got was brought a Geiger counter into the house. And while in the house, the Geiger counter showed, you know, normal ambient, uh, you know, background radiation. When the phenomena started peaking, as we'll discuss in one moment, the needle on the gyre counter went to zero and stayed there, as if whatever zero. it was was pulling energy out of the environment rather than putting any energy. That's absolutely fascinating. So even the background radiation disappeared. <laughs> now, we were in the bedroom, and we began to see lights moving, flying about the room. And um, she told us what had been happening to her there, and her eldest son, who was a teenager, talked about seeing her being bounced around in her bed one night, like in the movie, by an invisible force, and he went to help her, and he was just flipped backwards and thrown into the wall. Um, we heard all this, but we saw these lights, and uh, it was incredible. We tried to take some pictures. Uh, nothing happened that time, but we came back another time, and we now steeled off the bedroom from all external lighting. What lights, the first time, what lights were you seeing? Looked like little comets corpuscular masses of light with tails on them, flying about the room, always in greenish-yellow in color. And we saw these that looked like darting around the room, and you know, these, there are no fireflies on the West Coast, so we knew they weren't, you know, that wasn't the cause. But again, we didn't have a controlled environment, so we came back the next, the next night, we sealed off the room, we put up, uh, we, everything was dark, and we again saw the lights. We brought you know, professional photographers with us beside our own cameras, and we did get a picture of one of the lights. It was a ball of light with a tail on it. But we couldn't tell where it was coming from, where it was going to. There was no reference. We couldn't tell its speed. We couldn't, uh, didn't know the direction it was in. So we put up black poster boards on the wall with duct tape. Okay, do I have one of these photographs? Uh... Um, I sent you one of the pictures. I don't know if you put them all up on, the, on your web page. Um, I sent you, I think the ones you put up deal with the arcs of light. Now, the, these were what we were seeing when these arcs were photographed we were seeing balls of light three-dimensional balls of light like ball lightning for lack of a better term flying madly about the room the arcs of light we never visually observed what we think we caught were the equivalent of time lapses meaning if you have a taking a picture of a star and your camera isn't on a, on a, um, a motor drive platform or motion uh -huh. platform you get streaks we think that's what we ended up obtaining in this case uh, we, these pictures were taken with tri Kodak Triax film, pushed to 6400 ASA in development, and we used a deep red gel over the uh, over the flash. All right, um, I see uh, one photograph that says the two arcs shown in this uh, photo arcs appear to be at right angles to each other. These free-floating spatial images are not bent 
in conformance to the walls behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, same balls of light were observed during this photograph as in photograph 5 above. Now, is that what you're talking right, about? Right, right. These arcs of light. In that particular picture, the arcs are at right angles to each other. And That's at that right. time, we were seeing balls of light fl flying madly about the room. And uh, You're right. They're like little comets, almost. Right. Um, and as uh, the closer to the object, uh, it's thicker, and then it seems to trail off as you would imagine it would. That's right. really bizarre. And what's imp most impressive is that behind the arcs, um, in that and one of the other pictures, the walls meet at a 90-degree angle. If this were a projected image against the wall and not in free space, the image uh -huh. of those arcs would be bent in, in accordance with the wall, yet they are not, which tells us that, it's, uh, that if these lights were in, were, were in free space. What was the attitude like in the room when all this was going on? How many people were there? Um, up to 25 or 30 people. 25 uh, or 30 numerous people? Numerous photographers, and I should say that during these these uh, frequent outbursts of light the uh, the woman said that she put certain records out al record albums on some heavy metal stuff some really weird music the lights would come on so we put the records on the lights appeared and at one point in the middle of uh, one of the, these light displays an apparition appeared in the corner of the bedroom a large muscular man the upper torso from about the waist up you could see the the arms the neck the shoulders the head no salient facial characteristics but a very distinct large man and at that point two assistants who were with us just passed out uh, I understand that uh, I wonder if we might call that apparition the rapist uh, I don't or know maybe I mean, the all alleged, I know is that we all rapist. saw the same thing at the same time yet our cameras that were firing you know consistently did not capture that image they captured lights just balls of light and arcs which makes no sense because you know it, it's a paradox you should be able to photograph what you see and being able to photograph what you can see it makes it all the more you know, problematic. Okay, but at this point, uh, with this much phenomena going on that you're documenting, even getting photographs of, uh, you've got to begin to believe the lady when she says oh. she's getting raped. Yes, we, we, we believed that she experienced something. The rape is difficult to document because obviously sure. it wasn't a virgin. We weren't there. We weren't able to take the proper medical test. But what was more impressive were... One night we got a frantic call, and the woman says that the poster boards had been torn off the wall. So we come to the house in the middle of the night, and they had indeed all been torn down from the ceiling and the walls, taking the uh, duct tape with it plus the plaster and the paint, and the room was a shambles. And, of course, the woman could have done that, but it, it's, it's unlikely from what, we, what we've seen. It, it didn't occur. These, these were the ones that you had put up? Correct, to, to determine, to reference the pictures we were getting because we, we weren't able to determine the, you know, the direction or orientation of the lights. Um, uh, one night, uh, some candelabras flew at her. Another night, the fuse box was torn out of the wall and thrown at her, just missing her head. Holy mackerel. Now, on the last night we were at this house, which was October 31st of 1974, and it happened to be a full moon, we brought an image intensifier, a low-light uh, scope attached to a, um, a, a camera, and nothing was really going on except for very weak lights. And we asked the lights to, you know, whatever this thing was, to do something more than producing lights because it wasn't very responsive. And at that point, we saw duct tape being pulled off the wall, off the ceiling by, un like, by unseen hands. You saw that yourself? Yes, being pulled off, and the poster board flew through the room and hit the woman being haunted in the head. <laughs> Land, you know, just bang, right in her head. Oh. We asked again, another poster board, more duct tape is pulled off, and flew and dropped at her feet. All right, doctor, hold hold on right there. Uh, you're listening to the story of the entity. Uh, actually, it wasn't then called the entity. Obviously, it was one later made into a movie called The Entity. I'm Art Bell, and this is CBC. Toll free 
west of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. My guest is Dr. Barry Taff. And we'll get back to him in a moment. We're talking about the case that later became the movie called The Entity. Now, uh, to Dr. Barry Taff. Uh, Dr. Taff, if I saw lights flying around a room, even as a professional investigator, and I saw boards and tape flying off a ceiling or a wall, that would change my life forever. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat um, unsettling, although it didn't pose a direct threat to any of us, so at least myself and my colleague were pretty shocked, but we weren't, it wasn't like we didn't have the fight or flight response. You know, but but, but at the time, at the time it was happening, you could not have known that there might not have been a threat ahead. Um, I don't know, for some reason, to me, it was more like being at an e-ticket ride at Disneyland. I, I was shocked and amazed, but it didn't frighten me. It didn't scare me for some reason. Well, I guess I... because everything was directed at the woman as opposed to us. And one of the pictures we sent you, um, the woman is framed by the arc of light. Which, um, exactly which right. really significant because it's not just some haphazard, random thing. It's framing the woman. All right, now, in that photograph... Um, there are, there is the woman. She's sitting on the. Is it a bed? Correct. All right. She's sitting on her bed, and there are obviously a number of photographers uh, in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that is the real woman. That is the. That's the Mrs. B. That's the real woman from the entity case. Uh, it is almost twenty, almost twenty-three years ago. God. And, and, and and what's important is the secondary arc to the left. Of the frame. Yes. That's in front of the, one of the photographer's heads. Yes. Which again tells us that this is a three dimensional phenomenon. It was not some, you know, thing projected against the wall. Um, it was, you know, I'll, I'll, as long as I live, I don't care how long that is, I will never forget those nights because it was something that you read about, you hear about, you see in B movies, but you never expect to encounter. When this was going on, when this arc was above her, what was her um, demeanor like? Well, it wasn't the arc. We were seeing balls of light flying around her. Right. And everyone was just, like, stunned, and they were, like, frozen in amazement. And we were just firing cameras and watching, trying to see if we could, you know, see a source for this. And, of course, there wasn't any apparent source. The room was almost pitch black at the time. So the light that you obtained... As a matter of fact, let me ask you, I've got a fax here. It says, Dear Art, what kind of camera was your guest using to take these photos? The shutter speed... And camera settings don't seem possible unless he was using a special camera. Uh, the 35 millimeter, I think it was a Pentax. Um, uh, the film speed was one sixtieth of a second. The shutter speed, um, using a flash with a deep red gel over it, which filtered it into the very light close to the near infrared. Um, the room was pretty much pitch black. The only illumination beside the arcs with the balls of light were from our filtered flash or our strobe. All right. She's got her head down or turned away. She's cowering under the balls of light. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Uh, what she was cowering? Uh, like, oh my God, it's over me. You know, because this stuff had you know been harming her for quite some time, and so she was like du almost ducking as it was flying over and around her. Um. All right. So now, what's, what's, I guess what's important is you know the phenomenon stopped. She moved after October 31st of 74 from Culver City to Carson. And we lost track of her for a while. We found her again, and we thought, well, it's all gone now. She's moved. No, the phenomena moved with her. Moved and with most, her. Mo what's very significant about this case and is very telling is that uh, shortly after she moved in her house, people on both sides of her were flanking her. B both of their homes began experiencing her poltergeist outbreaks. Objects flying around, garbage, you know, things coming out of cupboards, garbage being dumped on the floor, pounding noises, lights. And at this time, we had not published anything yet on the case, and we certainly had not exposed her to the media or anything. So, what's going on? Uh, yeah, and so now you've got more witnesses. You've got people in right. homes on both sides. Exactly. Who didn't even know her plight. They knew nothing about her, what was going on with her in, um, in Culver City. Um, we were, we went to her house in Carson. 
we witnessed more phenomena there. Ob a flower pot full of soil was thrown amongst the group of people and shattered in the middle of the floor. We heard strange, like, voices. We recorded some strange sounds of, um, of like, a, a deep breathing, moaning thing approaching the microphone and shut the recorder off. Really? Um, but we didn't see anything. Well, we saw some of the lights, but we never, it never got to the intensity it did in Culver City. We went back to the old Culver City house, and nothing's happened there. Did you keep those uh, recordings? Yeah, but the, all you hear is people talking the record, uh, the, the record, and then you hear like a smash, and you hear like voices. But it, it sounds like someone's walking up to, like a person is there, and they're they have respiratory problems, and they're approaching the microphone, and then it, they turn it off. That's all. It sounds like a B movie, like something you hear in, a, in an old mummy movie. Huh. But you know, since it's audio, it's an audible thing as opposed to visual. Doesn't carry a lot of weight because how how really, did you come to know about the neighbors? Um, apparently, they were talking uh, amongst themselves, and they actually came into her house and said, "If you had these weird experiences going on," and she said, "What?" And they told her, and she said, "Well, yeah, I've been going. This has been happening to me for years." I see. So I mean, you're living a nice, peaceful, peaceful life. Everything was normal, down to earth, and then, then all of a sudden, suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Yeah, all hell. <laughs> So um, it's, a, it's a very disturbing situation, and uh, so now we assume that, and I should say, she finally moved out of Carson from to San Bernardino, and the phenomena moved with her there. She moved from San Bernardino to Texas, the phenomena moved with her there. It is. It went with her to Texas? Yes, and so we assume, because it's centered around her, that it's more psychokinetic in origin than, you know, than perhaps discarnate. I mean, there's no way of really knowing one way or the other, but we assume that because it followed her. Um, well, I, is that really a safe assumption? Uh, yeah. In other words, that it is coming from within her? Well, if you look at it from a psychological perspective, she claims she was attacked by three male entities. Yes. Um, she had three male children. Um, yeah, like, wait, excuse me, three, three male children and one female child. And she said that she had, it was a very volatile relationship, extremely volatile, and it doesn't take a lot to, you know, to uh, project into the situation that um, these hostilities and animosities with their children were manifesting or sublimated into her unconscious, and this was the psychokinetic manifestation of it. Huh. But that's that's a, that's a that's a real big leap in logic. I mean, that's like an Oedipal thing almost. Did she submit herself to any medical testing? Yeah, uh, Frank DeFelitter ran some tests with her, um, psychological tests, other tests, nothing. Uh, abnormal showed up, other than the fact that she was tremendously distressed and high, very anxious, and um, sort of the quintessential poltergeist agent. We refer to these people as being um, a lot of anxiety, uh, repressed hostilities, generalized anger, um, deeply un deep unresolved emotional conflicts, uh, sort of all wound up with nowhere to go, sort of a mass of conflicting impulses. And she typified that. And many of the other poltergeist agents that I've come to know over the years have exactly the same psychological profile. Mrs. B is still alive and living in Texas? We don't know. She, We know she moved back to Southern California in the 80s and uh, early 80s, and the last time I had any contact with her was when the entity came out, which was in uh, February of 1983, and I haven't heard from her since 83, and I don't know if she is or where she is. Would you like to? Um, yes, but I think the last I talked to her, I remember she said that nothing had happened for a very long period of time. It had been very quiet, as she apparently as she had grown older as the kids grew up and sure. moved out. Uh, well, we cover the nation like a great blanket, and uh, just in case she is out there and can get to a fax machine, um, I would very much appreciate it, uh, Mrs. B, if you're listening, uh, because we have promoted this show. Fax me a phone number, which I will keep to myself, and we will call you. Uh, we are at area code. My fax number is area code 702-727-8499. Again, 702-727-8499. Be interesting to speak with her. Um, all right, doctor. Um, so that is the entity case, but by no means, this is where you shocked me last time, by no means was it necessarily the wildest, was it? Um, no, uh, up until that time, of <laughs> course, it was. Um, uh, 
but since then we've had cases that it, it dwarf the entity case of one in particular, um, which we call the San Pedro case, or an unknown encounter, as the video is going to be called. And, oh, oh, there's going to be a video. Right. Um, it's called an unknown encounter, which is the video which chronicled and documented our investigation of the San Pedro case, which began in, again, August, <laughs> for some reason. That month is important to us, um, of 1989. And uh, it was it was a spectacular case. Uh, what happened? A woman, actually, a, a woman named Susan Castaneda called me and told me she had a friend that was plagued with all sorts of paranormal experiences that were traumatizing her. But she was so concerned about our um, attitude that she, our belief that she might be crazy, she didn't want to talk to us. So she finally got up enough courage to call back after some, you know, peripheral conversations and. Uh, we made an appointment to come out and talk to her, and we went out there in San Pedro. Um, it was August 8, 1989, and uh, she was in a, in a strange relationship from her husband. She had two very young children, babies, essentially, mm -hmm. and a little uh, turn-of-the-century sort of um, house uh, on 11th Street in San Pedro. And we walked in the house, and there was that same rotten smell, that same odor of decomposing organic matter, that was present in the entity, and also something else that was present in the entity, um, a sense of overpressure. The best way to describe this would be if you go down in a deep pool or go scuba diving, the pressure you feel around your head and your ears if you go sure. deeper in the water. Sure. And that is a very common effect we've seen in many cases. Is that measurable? No. But no. You, it's just something you feel. It's a subjective experience. Uh, if you bring in you know, devices to measure the barometric pressure, uh, it doesn't show anything, but it's a demonstrable effect in terms of pretty much everyone senses it. And we don't know what this is, but everyone like holds their nose and blows to equal the pressure in their station tube. So we don't know what that is. Anyway, um, we interviewed the woman named Jackie Hernandez, and she told us of seeing a disembodied head in the attic, seeing several full, you know, blown male apparitions wearing clothes like uh, from the late 40s, early 50s, gasoline attendant clothes, uh, tucked in high water you know, uh, pants, really? uh, plaid shirts, and they were very ugly-looking men. And she was at her wit's end. Objects were being thrown about the house. Um, fires were breaking out. Fires? Uh, furniture what, uh, being moved around. Oh my gosh, uh, how long had all this been going on? Uh, since it, October of 88, when she moved in. So it was quite a period of time before she contacted you. Right, before she got up enough nerve to call us without the fear of, you know, being labeled a quack. And uh, we, we had listened to her, and uh, she told us a number of things. Water pouring out of two-by-fours, uh, for which there was no source. Um, during the course of the interview, we heard strange pounding noises coming from the attic. It sounded like a 200-pound rat was gallivanting around up there. Uh -huh. And she told us that's where she saw the disembodied head. So we went up in the attic and took some pictures, didn't see anything, came back down, talking with her some more, going around the house, checking it out. And, sure. Um, talking to several friends of hers that were there to witness the phenomena, and we heard the pounding again. One of our photographers, an assistant um, named Jeff Wheatcraft, he went up into the attic to take a, a final set of pictures with a 35 millimeter, and he's up there taking pictures. Now, when he was doing that, uh, my colleague, Barry Conrad, who's a videographer I work with, uh, and I and, and some other people were downstairs, and we were waiting for Jeff to come down so we could leave because it was getting very late. And uh, we suddenly hear a, a, like a, a crashing sound, and Jeff comes flying out of the, uh, the back end of the kitchen where the crawl space was to the attic, and he's white as a sheet, and he's perspiring heavily, and he's shaking. And uh -huh. he said something had violently grabbed the camera out of his hands. And I said, what do you mean, you dropped it? He says, no, it's like he was taking pictures, and the camera was just forcefully pulled out of his hands. And so we went back up in the attic, we found the camera. Uh, the body had been separated from the lens very neatly. The body was on one side of the attic. The lens was on the other. Wow. And yet there was no one in the attic. So what pulled the camera out of his hand? While exploring the attic with Jeff and Barry Conrad and myself, something shoved Jeff and pushed him across the attic, yet there was nothing behind him physically that we could see. So, you, um, in other words, you were present when he was pushed across. Yes, and we it looked like... The equivalent would be if a very large man had uh, very uh, had shoved him with great force in his back, vaulting him forwards. And you suddenly see his body move forwards, but in a very unusual manner, like someone pushed him in the middle of his back. Gotcha. And we, you know, look, what's that? And he, and he yelled and didn't know what that was. Um, 
the first night there was also some viscous liquid dri- dripping out of her cupboard, oozing out of her cupboard, and it smelled very strange. It was like a yellowish, uh, viscous liquid, yellowish orange. And we put it into a sample bag. We later had it analyzed. It turned out to be human blood plasma. Human blood, blood plasma coming out of a out of a cupboard. Out of a cupboard. And we have now, video. We have videotape of this. You do. Yes, and uh, we had it analyzed, and we don't. We couldn't. We couldn't determine the source because there's obviously no one walled up in that little house. Well, when you opened, you must have opened the cupboard. When we opened the cupboard. We even pulled off some, some some of the wood panels, and there was nothing there except more more of the viscid fluid. So we never made a determination of, uh, beyond that point. Um, Subsequent to our first night's visit, um, Jackie was sleeping one night out of the living room because the bedroom, there were strange noises and the bed kept collapsing and objects were being thrown at her and her kids. She's sleeping on the floor with her kids and a friend stayed over. And all of a sudden, the friend wakes up and hears Jackie ga- gasping for air, choking. She sees this glowing, luminous cloud over Jackie, suffocating her, and she pulled Jackie out from under it. Now, by this time, we had... We had given Jackie some cameras to take pictures when we weren't there, as well as the cameras we brought. We brought, um, you know, high-end like beta cams or video cameras and 35 millimeters. Sure. And we were obtaining some pictures of lights that we couldn't explain. They looked like um, tracer bullets traveling in excess of 80 miles an hour, sometimes up to 211 miles per hour. Very similar to the entity case, but a little smaller in size. Um, one of the subsequent nights, September 4th of 89. Um, it was very late, and Jeff's back up in the attic with some other people, and he, everyone's coming down. He's about to come down. He's the last one. We hear a moan, and one of our photographers named Gary Bame turns back, and he was a trained photographer. He fired the camera several times, and as he approaches Jeff, he's, he sees Jeff as being hung, yet there's no one near him. Jeff's the only person up there that, that, that you know, and we, there's, something wrapped around his neck and it's got him hung up on a huge nail coming out of one of the rafters and it's hanging him, literally. Hanging him. Hanging We've got, Jeff, and this is one of the pictures I sent you. And, and it's one of the pictures I've got on the webpage. This man, Jeff Wheatcraft, right. uh, is seen hanging from a rafter. Right. Uh, what, what was wrapped around his neck? A piece of plastic clothesline tied in a bowling knot. A bowling knot, a bowling knot. And it was intricately wrapped around his neck, and it produced a very deep rope burn. And had not had it not been for Gary Bame, Jeff would have been killed. Very quickly, I should imagine. Yes. So he got him down, and Jeff was in shock. And all he remembered was walking towards the crawl space, suddenly feeling something pulling up on his neck, and then he blacked out. And fortunately, we have a couple of pictures from 35 the 35 millimeter camera of that particular event, and um, that totally traumatized Jeff. I mean, completely, and he never again went into the house after that night. I don't blame him. I don't blame him at all. Uh, in fact, it probably traumatizes him to this day. Do you still talk with him? Um, not so much. Um, he, he's, he's demonstrating symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm sure um, he is. He, strangely enough, he continued in the investigation, but not in that house. Um, Jackie finally moved from the house. Uh, we, 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 had, we recorded some other strange anomalous lights with videotape and 35 millimeters. She moved from San Pedro up to Weldon, California, which is about 350 miles north of Los Angeles. And uh, I couldn't go up there with uh, Barry Conrad and Jeff Wheatcraft but, because of my schedule, but they went up there, and more lights were seen. Uh, one of them videotaped flying into the shed behind the house where strange things were occurring. And that was, um, the speed of that was determined to be 211 miles per hour. Uh, how do you determine the speed um, of it? Well, by knowing the frame rate of the video and how much distance is traveled in the frame. And across so many frames, we can have an estimate as to speed. A lot of legitimate scientists right now are studying something really weird that occurred in the atmosphere. Uh, the upper atmosphere, uh, I think in August, ha, 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 again, August, in which an object traveled through the atmosphere at one one-hundredth the speed of light. It was a light object itself, and 
They have no idea what it was. It maintained its shape, which if projected from Earth, it would not have. So it was, it was a real something, but traveling a lot faster than what you measured. Doctor, stand by. We'll be right back. This is CBC. on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First-time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Once again, here I am. Hello, everybody. Great to be here. My guest is Dr. Barry Tapp. That's T-A-F-F, -F, Dr. Barry Tapp. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, he's got some stories to tell. Uh, he worked with the parapsychology lab at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute for nine years, investigated the paranormal, the case known as the Entity and the San Pedro case, and much more. We're in the middle of the, uh, of the San Pedro case right now. And there's another photograph I want to talk about. As a matter of fact, I've got uh, a fax here from Daryl in Rancho Mirage. And he says, Art, I'd suggest your listeners go directly to the Barry Taft images on your web page. They are remarkable. And I suggest you do that, too. The photographs from the cases we're talking about were sent to me by Dr. Taft. I scanned them and uploaded them. Take a look. Don't believe our words. Take a look at the actual evidence. It is incredible. We'll get back to Dr. Tapp in a moment. And again, for those just joining the program at this hour, uh, the surveys are just beginning to come in, radio surveys. And once again, in Los Angeles, we're an overwhelming number one. And now... In San Diego on KFMB, number one. <laughs> so thank you, everybody in Southern California. The first uh, couple of surveys uh, to come out. Uh, KFMB just absolutely wiped up the map in this time slot with everybody in San Diego. And in Los Angeles, ditto for KABC. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, back now to Dr. Chaff. Uh, doctor, there is another photograph uh, from the San Pedro case. Uh, it apparently shows, a, I guess, a living room uh, with a television. Well, that's actually a bedroom. A bedroom, all right, a bedroom with a TV. And actually, you can see the picture on the television. That's how clear it is. And it shows an object that kind of like, I guess, we were discussing just prior to the top of the hour, a light object just sitting there. What was it doing? Um, a number of these amorphous plasmas, for lack of a better term, were flying about the room. Um, Jackie's child was watching television, and these lights were just swimming all over the room. So she took out one of the cameras we gave her and started clicking off pictures. And this is one of the more spectacular ones. I'll say. And it, it looks, I mean, looks like a diminutive, you know, a disc with a cupola on top. It sure does, almost like a UFO. Yeah, right. And another picture that we didn't give you, which we haven't transferred from video to film, the one at 211 miles per hour, when we freeze-framed it and enhanced it, it, we showed it to about two dozen people and got their independent response, and everyone said, oh, it looks like a little UFO. Yeah, now, yeah, that's exactly what What are these what images like. doing in this type of case? I mean, well, why are we even seeing things like this? And... One of the other pictures I sent you, the three balls of light yes. um, hovering over the rug. Um, phenomenal. These are point sources. These are they have defined edges, yet they're corpuscular, they're three-dimensional nature. They overlap each other. One is even casting a little shadow over the other. I know it's incredible. And they're, and they're emitting light in only 
two directions. Now, let, let, let me ask you. And down towards the rug, but right. not backwards to the, towards well, the wall. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask you. There is light obviously being emitted toward what looks like a rug on the floor. That's what it is? Mm -hmm. Okay, that light is from those objects? Correct. Oh, my God. Um, that was taken without a flash. Without a flash. Without a flash. We have numerous, but that's just one of many pictures we have. Um, this case became so strange, as I said, when we followed Jackie up to Weldon. Uh, well, I wasn't there, but Barry Conrad and Jeff Wecraft did. And they were sitting in her little trailer house one night, and it got very cold and very quickly, and the table began to shake, and the chairs began to shake. And suddenly, Jeff in his chair is picked up bodily with the chair. The chair drops down. Jeff... Now, Jeff's about 6'2", about 170, 580 pounds. He's picked up. The chair drops down. He arcs up to where the ceiling meets the wall, and he's knocked unconscious as he hits the wall. What? This happened in a split second. So Barry Conrad, and even though he's an excellent videographer and a you know, really gifted cameraman, he, there's no way he could have gotten the camera into position because we didn't anticipate this. And uh, we thought Jeff was dead. He, he was unconscious. He was brought to consciousness, and he remembered something equivalent of a giant boxing glove compressing his diaphragm, and he just, you know, blacked out. All right, look, at this point, I'm going to ask what I know the audience will ask, because they did on Dreamland. So much violence occurred to Jeff uh, during the course of these investigations that a lot of people wondered if Jeff might not have been the catalyst for it. Now, this is intriguing, and this is only two of many more instances that occurred. We um, once... Uh, well, before I get to specifically answer that, on another occasion, after Jackie had visited Barry Conrad's house in Studio City and she left, phenomena broke out there. Objects began flying around, machines going on and off, glass flying through the air, fires breaking out. Um, All Jeff, without Jeff. Uh, Jeff was there. Oh, Jeff was there. And okay. In fact, at one point, something threw him across the room and gouged out his back. You could, we have a video of the, it looked like a claw just scraped his back. And we've got it on camera, which is even... He was holding a video camera before he turned it off, and he's propelled across the room in a somersault, and you see the camera rolling with him. Wasn't it about time for Jeff to consider retirement? Yeah, well, this was his last... This was almost his last case. And yeah. um, what's interesting about this case, again, from a psychological perspective, Jackie Hernandez um, was in dire straits because of all this phenomenon. Didn't know where to go. She of had two course. small children. And Barry Conrad really befriended her, came to her help, besides documenting this case wonderfully. He really befriended her, and she misinterpreted his assistance as a romantic interest. And but you know, Barry was helping her because he's a, he's a very kind, gentle person. So she would try to get you know involved with Barry, and he just kept her at arm's distance. And Jackie felt that Jeff, his, who was Barry's best friend at the time, was was with the impediment because you know Jeff was always there, and she couldn't you know uh -huh. get get that attached to Barry. And so then we thought, well, maybe. If she got rid of Jeff, Jeff was out of the picture, um, she'd have a clear shot at Barry. And when I discussed this with Jackie, she acknowledged it. She said, yes, that's true. But that doesn't explain how her mental state or anxiety translated into a psychokinetic force that could, you know, throw Jeff across the room like a ragdoll and almost hang him. Okay, and again, all of this began, everybody should know, and brought you there before Jeff ever entered the picture. Right, right. Jeff was just in, you know, a sort of a, a sidebar to the situation. Things were happening before she even, who, Jackie even knew my name, Barry Conrad's name, or Jeff Wecraft's name. Um, there were other things that came up in the case which suggested there were, Jackie used Ouija boards with friends, and it told her there was a man named Herman Hendrickson that lived in the house who, uh, no, uh, Hendrickson who was killed, never lived in the house, he was killed on San, in San Pedro Bay, drowned in 1930, and that his murderer bared a striking resemblance to Jeff. Now, we can't prove who killed him, but we did prove that this man existed and that he was indeed killed in 1930 in San Pedro Bay. That's in the archives. Well, here's a wild stab for you. Had anybody ever considered uh, a regressive uh, hypnotherapy on Jeff uh, with regard to the po a possible prior life? Um, he wasn't too open to that possibility. He was the, the, the idea didn't. I mean, but by this time he was so unnerved by what had happened, he just wanted to sort of remove remove himself from the case. I understand that, and I can understand why. It's uh, when phenomena broke out at Barry's house on a number of occasions. Um, it was uh, we were there with the crew from Kern Affair, and the stove turned on, bullets went flying through the air, glass broke. 
machines turned on, uh, liquid papers floating through the room at other times, um, his editing bay. Control buttons were being pushed, levers were being moved, yet there was no one near the bay. Um, uh, grease pencil marks appeared on the camera lens of the beta cam, yet there was no one there. Could I ask, um, you were coming from UCLA's parapsychology lab. Mm -hmm. When you got a call like this, or once you determined you weren't going to stamp a P for a psychiatric right. case on something, right. and you were really going to go investigate it, mm -hmm. how did you gear up to go do that? What kind of a team would get together, and what would you take with you? Well, we'd first, I mean, the, the, if it was back in the 70s, we were very limited compared to what we could do now, but yeah. we'd bring cameras with, we'd bring various instruments. I mean, sometimes we'd bring magnetometers, sometimes you know, electrometers, I mean, frequency counters, um, image intensifiers, which are like night vision scopes, uh, thermal imaging systems, which is you know, infrared video. Um, we're trying to document visually as much as we can, and frequently we'd have the you know, people living in the environment, if it's so suggestive, take, you know, psychological tests. Sure. To determine what kind of profile we're dealing with. And if it's really blatant and obvious, we don't do that because, you know, we see the history is right in front of us. Um, that's what we usually bring with. And now, because we have, you know, we have very modern camcorders, digital handy cams and beta cams, and we bring all of that with because if we can't document the investigation visually, it has no value. I mean, it's just like this, the fish that got away. Well, but, yes, but of course you have you know, a number of people there, so you at least, you have witnesses. Well, witnesses, like in the entity case, are very important, but they don't, stay, it doesn't even compare to... Photographic to, evidence. Well, videotape. And unfortunately, today, with the modern technology, anything can be faked. And people always say, well, that could be done on a computer. That's the, the yeah. computer, that CGI work. And I, I said, well, you know, just because something can be faked doesn't mean that the real event, you know, it didn't occur. That's like saying because we can make a movie about going to the moon, and make it look like we were really there, that we never went with Apollo. Well, yes, but when you add eyewitness testimony, multiple eyewitness testimony, and photographic evidence, right. then it seems to me it gets pretty hard for the debunkers. Right, and, and then on top of it, in, in the, in the, with the San Pedro case, is a crew from um, Strange Universe went down to her original house in San Pedro, a little bungalow, and we assumed this case was a poltergeist case because it kept following Jackie. So... They went down to original house to shoot some B-roll for a show that just aired the other night, and they entered the house to just take some video, and their equipment died. And they came outside, the equipment came back on. They went back in, the equipment died again. Came back outside, it came back on again, and they never had that happen before. And this is what happened to us when we were there back in 89. So it means there's something in that house or in that environment that's affecting the electronics of the camera. Or the battery. Uh, do, you do you think affecting in the sense that it, uh, I recall what you said about the uh, background radiation disappearing, which is really weird. I would have thought, you know, radiation would increase uh, with the presence of something emitting energy, but just the opposite occurred. Even the background radiation disappeared. It would be endothermic, meaning it absorbs energy rather than... Exactly. Energy. Exactly. Um, so the key question is, were the batteries... Uh, run down? No, the batteries were not run down. Not and our, run down. I reviewed our last show, and your question was, did the camera, was everything normal afterwards? In fact, yes, it was. The batteries were perfectly charged. The camera worked fine once it was out of that space. Now, what's interesting <laughs> is that from a haunting perspective, haunt, haunting seemed to affect the physical environment. Poltergeist seemed to be around people. Now, we assume this was, you know, a haunting. I mean, for Poltergeist case, because it was following Jackie, and now it looks like her original house is affected, which certainly throws a, uh, a, a wrench into her theory. But again, if, it's, if she can go to someone's house and then leave it and phenomena breaks up, that suggests that she's acting like a capacitor and she's charging up right. the environment. When she leaves, people trigger the effect. In fact, she visited Barry Conrad's house middle of last year to look at the additional footage we were, we, we were putting together for the video. Mm. And while she was sitting there, uh, one of the glass doors on Barry's Entertainment Center just flew off and dropped right in the middle of the room for no apparent cause. And that was, you know, it's never done that before. So again, what's the source? And it's always when she's anxious and nervous and, you know, kind of wired and... Uh, it's, um, and it must build on itself. In other words, once something like that occurs... 
whatever level of anxiety you had just went through the roof. Right. It's a feedback loop. It's a, it's a, like a, it's exactly. a closed loop that the anxiety and the stress creates more, um, perhaps, adrenaline in the body, which then pumps this thing out even further. But again, that's assuming it's a poltergeist. It's a psychokinetic phenomena. If the house is still affected, which certainly there's a suggestion that it is, what's there? I mean, is this like a psychovirus where it infects the environment energetically? You come in the environment, and if you're susceptible, it alters you in some way, and then you carry it with you and propagate it in another location? Okay. Um. What is your best guess? The monster from the id creating I, all of this around somebody, or something external? I wouldn't even guess. I wouldn't even want to guess. Or, or maybe know. both. Pardon? Maybe both. Yeah, it's like um, we're like the three blind men touching different parts of the elephant. Depending yeah. on what part we're touching, we describe it differently. But we don't know. It's again, it's an unknown cause. Um, I mean, I don't know. I you know all the trouble they've had at Denver International Airport? Right, on sacred ground. Yeah, you know, that, that airport was built on native ground mm -hmm. uh, against the advice of many. And, of course, their luggage system, a billion dollars worth and all the rest of it, they've had so much trouble there. That would suggest a haunting, wouldn't it? Well, suggest that that is sort of based, uh, built on sacred ground. And we've had numerous cases uh, of hauntings on that, in that environment. And it seems like there's some sort of force there that disrupts electromechanical, electro, uh, electronic activity. Is it from the ground or is it the, the building well, itself? Well, we, I think it's the space because we've had cases where old houses that were haunted were torn down and new condos or homes were built and the new mm -hmm. condos or homes were haunted. So it suggests that the space is affected, whether it's from the ground or it's some sort of space-time anomaly. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know, I, but you know what's interesting? As I said when, when I was last on, when I was on Dreamland, we've had a number of cases that began as poltergeist manifestations and evolved into abductions, and others that started as abductions and evolved into poltergeists, which suggests that the encounter with one alters you in some way to make the, the next one much more likely. What that means, I don't know. Uh, is there a way? I, I know this sounds dumb, but I inevitably get faxes asking. Believe it or not, there are people who want this kind of thing to happen to them. Well, that's like that's like wanting to lose control of your nervous system or lose con or or develop incontinence. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's the most disruptive thing that could happen. And beyond that, beyond the physical turmoil and stress, if you start telling your friends and neighbors about it and family, you're going to lose them very quickly because they're going to assume you're out of your mind. Um, people still have a tremendous skepticism. Um, about this. Uh, having, having said that, though, are there ways for the totally bizarre people out there who do want this to open yourself to this sort of thing? Um, no, no I, I don't think there is. I think that there are certain profiles, certain types of people that are more prone to it than others. It may have to do with the way they're physically put together or emotionally put together, which, you know, who knows how complicated that is. And it may have to do with certain environments they've come from or they're currently in. But I'd suggest that uh, I've known too many people that have been in this area, either as researchers or as experiencers, that have literally come apart at the scene, and uh, their life has been destroyed. It is interesting you should say that. Um, I spoke in the last interview I did with Ed Dames, again, the remote viewer, mm -hmm. and he said, you know, in the military program, um, one of the things we didn't talk about a lot, but that certainly occurred, was that a lot of the people who uh, began to try and do this discipline ended up out of the program and psychologically uh, damaged for life. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, a lot of the people that worked with us, when we were at UCLA, um, developed messianic complexes and frequently lost the ability to differentiate between reality and fantasy, and that's really? called psychosis. Really? And um, this is just dealing with, you know, phenomena such as telepathy or precognition, remote viewing, whatever you want to call it. Um, at a very simplistic mental level, so to speak, we're not even talking about a haunting or a poltergeist or an abduction. Asking to be abducted and having paranormal fallout is like asking to be repeatedly raped and yeah. then ridiculed in the press. Um, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, uh, to ask to be abducted, I'd run like hell. And yeah, I, it's, I, it's, it's like saying, would you like to be go, go into, go into a physio physiology lab and to be poked and prodded by people who didn't care about your health or the pain you that ensued 
and uh, and then threw you back out there without any sedation or tranquilizer. Do you think there may be a connection between what are known as abductions and the kind of paranormal activity that you have documented so well? I think there is in the sense that it seems that whatever forces are, uh, are, are producing these abductions, and I'm talking about the ones that are, we assume to be true, not anyone that makes these claims, because a lot of people are off the wall. All right, but, all right, doctor, hold that yeah. answer, hold that answer. We'll be right back. This is CBC. West of the Rockies at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. East of the Rockies at 1-800-825-5033. 1-800-825-5033. This is the CBC Radio Network. It absolutely is. My guest is Dr. Barry Taft, who worked with the parapsychology lab at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute investigating paranormal cases for nine years. Some of the most famous ones, many of which have been made into movies or videos. Books have been written because they really happened. Do you believe? <laughs> to Dr. Barry Taff, and uh, let's pick up where we left off. Abduction cases, paranormal uh, phenomenon of the, of the type that uh, is documented uh, in the photographs on my webpage, and I only have a few. There really are quite a few more, Doctor, I don't have, aren't there? Yes, there are many more. Many more. <laughs> yes, the thing is, apparently, my best guess at this point, based on what I've been seeing and experiencing and reading about, is that Whatever these forces are that are abducting people may use forces of nature, which we call paranormal, the way we use electromagnetism. And if they're doing so, then an encounter with these forces may in some way substantially alter us physically, emotionally, you know, psychically, to where we then start producing phenomena independent of that source and on our own. So in other words... It may not be exactly the same thing at work, but it may be the same forces at play. Right. They may have, I mean, found a way to artificially produce these forces we call paranormal through some electromagnetic or electromechanical means. We don't know, but we're looking at a very sophisticated technology, and we do know that electromagnetic forces can dramatically influence human behavior and performance. And, All right. Know, all right, I want to pick back up on something else that I, I let hang, and that is I mentioned that object that streaked through our upper atmosphere at one one hundredth the speed of light. Could there be a connection between that and what I see in this photograph, these light objects and the ones you talked about that traveled in excess of 200 miles an hour? I would know. I mean, I wouldn't even guess unless you, could, you saw a lot more of those things coming through the atmosphere, and they always correlated with the onset of certain types of paranormal phenomena. Who's to say? But I will say one thing: that there has been a correlation seen between what's called geomagnetic perturbation and poltergeist outbreaks. This is where the Earth's magnetic field, the mean frequency, is starts to oscillate and uh, go up and down in harmonics due to either terrestrial influences or solar influences. And when these occur, they seem to trigger outbreaks of psychokinesis around the world. Shouldn't these? Um Unusual areas of uh, magnetic flux activity be very detectable? Oh, they are, but we don't always have instruments running in all locations, and That's it true. seems to correlate with certain, um, uh, certain altitude, like altitude in certain areas of the Earth that are more prone to it than others. So uh, you have to have your instrument run instruments running pretty much all the time. Maybe it's like trying to catch a tornado. We have very unusual weather conditions. North America has a lot of tornadoes. Rarely uh, is, although more and more lately, uh, people do have cameras. But, I mean, a tornado is a very strange thing that just dips down, might do tremendous damage, and be gone in a matter of seconds. Right. Uh, and maybe this magnetic activity is similar in a way. In other words, a tornado of strange magnetic 
flux begins to occur, manifests for whatever period of time, and then is suddenly and as quickly gone. Well, perturbations can last for long periods of time, but they 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 vacillate, they 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 like fluctuate. It's not con continuous. So, depending on what causes them and their intensity or magnitude, will determine, and of course how widespread it is, will determine the uh, the uh, the amount of psychokinetic manifestations you get. But we're talking about the the really macroscopic stuff, the poltergeist, not the little tiny stuff people have done in laboratories. It's a very big <laughs> difference between the two. Um. Are there particular hot spots that uh, that you're aware of on Earth? Well, um, United United Kingdom for one, England, Ireland, Scotland for some reason seems to be a, a hotbed of activity. The Hawaiian Islands, really? Um, yeah, the Philippines. Really? Yeah, uh, a lot of what you might want to call haunting poltergeist activity in those regions. Why? But it's because they've been they've been, they've been lived on longer. There's been more activity there. Who knows? Or could it be there's some kind of you know hydromagnetic anomaly or geomagnetic anomaly. All right. Well, let's try the religious uh, connection. Now, it would seem to me that if I were a very, very re religiously devoted uh, a person, and something like I don't know San Pedro or any of the other things occurred to me, I might interpret that as some religious manifestation or miracle. And I wonder how many things, right now, all across the earth, we're having these uh, Marian apparitions and so forth. There's a lot of that going on right now. Connected? Well, it's some, some, of the, some of these obscure things people are seeing. I mean, they see a, 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 a strange aberration of light and glass panes, and they immediately assume there's a religious implication. Um, that's really stretching it. Um, but there are other, you know, phenomena which are much more distinct and, and direct, and it's really hard to say what the cause is, but it's, uh, you know, since the beginning of uh, probably two millennia ago, people have, you know, applied religious interpretations to these type of phenomena simply because they've been around since the dawn of human civilization have been recorded in one form or another, and it's only natural for people to, to, to reach to those lengths trying to explain something that, you know, they can't uh, come to grips with. Doctor, who does the kind of investigation today that you did in connection with UCLA then? Anybody doing that kind of thing now? Um, I'm trying to think. A, there are other people. There's uh, Dr. William Rowe. Um, he's in Georgia at uh, college down there. There are some people um, on the East Coast. I can't remember all their names. Over the top. There's um, up in San Francisco... There's uh, was a woman named Barbara Gallagher who worked with. Um, oh, I'm blanking out of the names here. There aren't that many people left. Um, well, I meant at the university level. In other words, are there any uh, entire departments devoted to this sort of thing? Well, no, we didn't have a department. Let me make that clear. We had a laboratory. A lab, all That's right. It. No department. All right, well, all right, a lab then. Yeah. Um, there were, I mean, there were stuff up at Stanford Research Institute, but they were doing just remote viewing. They weren't, uh, uh -huh. you know, focusing on, you know, hauntings and poltergeists. Um, Haunting the poltergeist, there was people doing work, like I said, in, in Florida, there's some people doing work, but it's not connected with universities anymore. That seems to be pretty much on the way out. I mean, there was work being done up in Orinda, California, back in the 70s and 80s um, at the John F. Kennedy University um, by a number of researchers, but that ended. All right, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you about something that's a shot in the dark here, but there have been document, there's been documentation now of... Uh, something that in popular culture is being called the chupacabra. Oh, yeah. However, um, while there's a lot of laughing that is associated with it, there are also hundreds, maybe thousands, of dead animals. And I watch Telemundo and uh, some of the other Spanish channels. And I'm going to tell you, I've seen them. These animals have had all of the blood removed from them, bites in the necks, all the blood gone. Uh, even bats, which are vampires, do not actually suck blood from from their victims. They they bite and they lap it up. There is, as far as I know, no known animal that actually drains blood. And there have been hundreds or even thousands so drained. What in the world or beyond it could do something like that? Well, I mean, uh, on the more prosaic level, you could say it, it could be a very... Um elaborate hoax on the part of who knows whom yeah. to stir up fear 
and anxiety and tension in these, in, especially in Puerto Rico. It's working. Um, it could be the, I mean, it could be something as some type of a, I mean, one of my friends who has a chupacabra side up, um, said it's a hybridized alien, you know, uh, earth animal that's, uh, going around doing its thing and again, possibly to scare people or it's some type of, you know, uh, cryptozoological creature that we're unfamiliar with or it's some extraterrestrial, but they did a, I think they did a, there was an article in the LA Times about this and there was some oh, yes. articles on some, I think some of the cable channels and they said a lot of the experiences um, in terms of people citing it were pretty much explained away when they really researched it. They invested, a lot of people broke down and they didn't see what they claimed they saw, but there have been legitimate sober people who did see things that That's they right. can't explain. So I think at the basis, uh, um, um, the basis for all this, there may be some base truth in the essence of it, but I think it, like with everything else, it gets blown out of proportion and exaggerated and embellished over time, and uh, people you know, use this thing to explain things that they're doing. Is there a way, Doctor, to measure uh, whether there are more uh, unexplained parapsychological type things going on today than last year or a decade ago or two decades ago, or does, does it... Uh, uh, can you graph it into peaks and valleys of activity? Well, if, if since no one, there's no central clearinghouse for documenting this, no one's actually compiling all this data in a um, in a you know in a database, right? Uh, to, in, in a sense that people can really you know isolate it and identify it and do longitudinal studies. Um, the closest thing that I read that they paired that was a thing called the Central Premonitions Registry that existed. Um, with Robert Nelson in New York, I think in the 60s and the 70s, maybe even through the 80s. Um, but that was only focused on prem pre premonitory visions or dreams. Um, it's, the paranormal is such a, a wide girth of uh, phenomena associated with it that it's really hard to say. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily expect it to be a correlation between psychokinetic phenomena and the more mental phenomena like remote viewing or precognition or telepathy um, because they're two different things. Has your investigation, all these years of work in this area, drawn you, uh, ha have you drawn any conclusions, let me ask that? In other words, w would you say these things are coming from pe disturbed people or that there is absolutely documentation of an external force that is present? You talking about the hauntings and poltergeists? Yes, sir. Um, I think it's both. I think that there's unquestionably, there's no question that a significant portion of the phenomena, such as in a poltergeist, is psychokinetically generated and comes from living human agents. And there's a small portion of the phenomena that strongly suggests that there's something that's either stored in time and space and can play itself back, or perhaps even discarded nature, that something, some form of intelligence or cohesive information survives that can somehow interact with the people. If I were to ask you about the nature of time itself, I wonder what you would say. I, I've, I've always sort of felt that time is our invention. Well, I, th I would say it's holographic. H holographic? In the sense that if precognition is real, and if, it, if we can perceive events that have not yet occurred, and the accurate information is very precise and accurate, it's not inferred or deduced, then that implies that the future, at least informationally, at some level, must exist. And my belief is, that, and this is from the remote viewing work and some of the other research we did, that all of time's information is contained in all of space. So each, all parts, all sections of space contain all information of all space and all time. The same way if you take a little piece of a hologram, it recreates the whole. Not the events, but the information that makes up all of space and all of time is contained in each section of space and time. Somebody once described it to me this way, see if you like this. Mm -hmm. Imagine a highway, mm -hmm. and um, you're in one car, and five miles ahead of you, or ten miles ahead of you, there's another car and a truck and blah, 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 on down the line. Well, in that car, at ground level, you can only see to the immediate horizon. You don't know there's a car and a truck five and ten miles ahead of you, but if you were in a helicopter, you would see your car plus all the others way out ahead, sort of in a timeline. But see, that's linear. That's linear. And this holographic is, is, is more three-dimensional. We're actually four-dimensional. What I'm getting at is the information about 
all the, all, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next year, the next yeah. decade, is that information is contained in today's space, just as all of yesterday's information is contained in today's space. The information about the space in Hawaii is contained in this space. <sighs> That would be a holographic distribution of information. It's equally distributed. I had one occurrence in my life of absolute, unquestioned um, precognition. Once. Never repeated. Did, did, didn't uh, un know how it began. I couldn't reproduce it. It's never happened again, but no question about it. It was precognition. Now, you're right. That has got to tell us something about time. To be able to know something is going to happen and then have it happen tells us something about time, doesn't it? Well, it also tells us that, I mean, it could suggest that there are multiple futures where there are an infinite number of branching alternatives, but it, it, it's much simpler than that in the sense that the future that you perceive either occurs as you saw it, occurs in a distorted fashion because you didn't see it accurately, or it doesn't occur at all. So there's only three ways. And if you set about to alter what you saw and you, you alter it, then you shouldn't have seen it. You see, there's a... There's, there's some paradoxes here. Um, but it, it impl if the future is predetermined or predestined, which can't be proven or disproven, then we're living in a controlled reality where, you know, all of our tomorrows are as much as, you know, as they're as real and tangible as our yesterdays. Do, um, you, do you think uh, that it will ever be possible to, in essence, travel in time in either direction? Yes. You do? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I think time is the dimension is real and as true as the other three dimensions we live in. It's just that we don't know how to manipulate it yet. Well, okay. Then inevitably, once you answer a question like that, people will say then, is it not possible that people from some future date when this has been figured out are visiting here? Well, but it may not work like a movie either. It may not work, in other words, if we had a time machine today, theoretically, based on what we do know, you couldn't go back and interact with the past where you never, where you never were. You could go back and watch it. Observe. You couldn't interact because you, your atoms didn't, your your body didn't exist then, and you would alter the timeline. Um, if you go forward, let's say if you jump 20 years forward, and no problem theoretically, but you can't then come back and relive those 20 years because you weren't here. So as long as you can't interact with the past and violate what's called the time or world line. Your then, then there is not that problem that everybody always discusses about, uh, y you know, changing something or killing your father, or, you know, all right. those stories. Right. In other words, we're not creating a, a cheap science fiction film, basically. There, in, in most films, there are these, you know, incredible, you know, uh, breakdowns in logic that just don't hold up. But theoretically, time should be as easily traveled at some level at space is it just that we haven't found out how to do all it. All right. When we do find out how to do it, and I am talking to some people right now who are very seriously working on a machine to uh, move in time, do you think it will be a mechanical, electrical device that will allow this, or do you think it will be a mental process? Well, if we travel mentally through time, there's no way of, we can't, it, that's like remote viewing. I mean, it's like, or like an out-of-body experience for that matter. It's, it's very subjective. I think that we will develop the machine that somehow produces artificial gravity, that produces the equivalent of an artificial wormhole or rotating black hole, and by creating a warped space that we can rotate at a certain speed, we'll be able to move through time. In other words, a real-time machine. A real-time machine, but the amount of energy required might be beyond anything we could comprehend. And, you know, it's... it's I think we have a better chance of, it, of build it, building interstellar starships than we do well, in the time. Well, do you, do you recall the stories of the uh, experiments that allegedly took place called the Philadelphia Experiment? Oh, yes. All right. I've had it technically described to me pretty well. And they used tremendous magnetic fields with rotating RF fields. Mm -hmm. uh, to produce what what apparently uh, is alleged to have uh, alleged to have occurred, um, so maybe interaction of different types of fields uh, may bridge the necessity for the kind of energy that you're otherwise imagining might be needed. Could that be? Well, I mean, we're talking about a unified field theory application. Yes. Which is, you know, theoretically.
theoretically it's great, but I don't know if anyone's accomplished it. The, I do know in the Philadelphia experiment they were trying for for radar invisibility, and what they achieved was optical invisibility, among other things. So it's, uh, it's you know, the physics behind this are probably, you know, locked away somewhere in a vault, a la Raiders of the Lost Ark. Do you think that, um, did you ever look into it at all? Did, did you, I've, no. read all I've read a lot of material on it, some of which I believe, a lot of it I don't believe. I mean, I just, I mean, some of the claims are really outrageous, but I think that some of the material, the, the basis for uh, the Eldridge and all that in 43 and, uh, you know, magnetic degaussers and everything, I wouldn't be surprised if that occurred. Because right. I, could, I could see the government, you know, actually working with that technology. Again, they would certainly want that, be looking for that anyway to cloak ships which were... Uh, of course, being on a, on a regular basis uh, sunk by uh, German submarines. Right. Uh, I can imagine they would. Absolutely fascinating. All right. I would like to uh, open the lines, which have been ringing solidly since we began, but I had so, so many questions for you. Are you open to uh, answering some questions from the audience? Yeah, no, I think it's getting it's about, it's about almost 2 o'clock. I think it's the most another half hour, I think we should. All right. All right, uh, let me do that then, uh, and stand by. We'll get right back to you. Absolutely Fresh Flowers is a flower farm in Southern California. All they do is grow miniature carnations. If there is a woman in your life, I guarantee you can please her with a shipment of these flowers. I really mean it. Trust me on this one. It's $42.95. And for that money, you get this giant shipment of flowers. In a large triangular box, little card in there, handwritten, your message, your name at the bottom, and it all arrives next day, boom, FedEx, you call tonight, they deliver tomorrow. Well, you call today, they deliver tomorrow. The number is 1-800-562-6438. That's 1-800-562-6438. copy of this program beginning now, you can call 1-800-917-4278. That's 1-800-917-4278. And uh, before we begin, Doctor, with the calls, you've got a videotape. I guess it's not out yet. No, it'll be out probably sometime late spring or summer. And it's a 95-minute video called An Unknown Encounter that documents and chronicles our investigation in the San Pedro case. And it covers pretty, docu it covers pretty much the entire case. Um, since it's not out yet, <laughs> when it does come out, how will people get it? Video it stores? or in all video stores. It will be sold through specialty catalogs uh, all across the country. And... Um, uh, I'm trying to think. It'll, it may even go into what's called point of purchase displays in stores like Thrifties and Save On. Ah, and it depends gonna... on, the, on the distribution. And what is the title going to be? An unknown encounter. An unknown encounter. So everybody needs to watch for that. All right. Um, to the phones quickly, I guess. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. Taff. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Kentucky. All right. Uh, I was wondering, does he have an 800 number or any number or address that we could talk, you know, to write to him personally? Good question. Uh, doctor? I have I have a number I can give out, but I should tell you that I can't. If you're looking for help in terms of for people, for us to come out and do work with you out there, we're, we're not funded. I mean, we're funded out of our own pockets, so we can't do work outside of this area because we don't have the means to do it financially. But I will give out my number. It's, okay. Uh, 310 273-2864. Okay, uh, give it again, please. 310-273-2864. All right. Uh, do you still have uh, equipment and uh, personnel who would be willing to participate with you, assuming somebody would fund an investigation? Oh, yes, we have. That's not, it's, uh, that's not a problem. The only thing is that the uh, some of the higher-end equipment we don't own, we have to rent it. It's extremely expensive. Sure. We only bring that in if a, if a case warrants it. I understand. All right. Wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Taft. Hello. Oh, hi, Art. Hi, hi, Dr. Taft. This is the genetically submutated human being abandoned from <laughs> being non-usable from the ETs. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I uh, believe uh, from 
various books I've read, uh, Barry, that uh, there's a constant flow of star people of different origins that engage in warfare and simultaneous genetic experiments. Seventy percent of the, seventy-seven uh, percent of the ghost uh, experiences, I think, are due to ET-related experiences. Well, that's what we were uh, uh, discussing earlier, whether there was a relationship, and the doctor apparently feels there is some kind of relationship, or if, if, if at least uh, at the level of the energies that are utilized. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, more, 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 more to the point that apparently an encounter with one increases your probability of having an encounter with another. Beyond that, it's only speculation. All right. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hello. Hi, Dr. Taff. Where are you, sir? I'm in Boston, Boston. Massachusetts. In Boston. All right. Mm -hmm. A curling photography camera would be very helpful for your work because it shows the energy, the spirits, and also, like as well as for haunted places, you can bring it to slaughterhouses where your animals are slaughtered and show spirits and mm -hmm. you can bring it to places where unwanted animals are slaughtered during the time of slaughter and show spirits and if you bring it to a hospital where someone is going to die soon then when the flat line gets on the machine and the beep starts to, that it signifies death you can turn the camera on and show the spirit leave the body do you plan to try that well i I, when I worked at UCLA, there was a, we were doing a lot of work with curling photography, and I personally, based, based on the research that's come out, um, I, I, don't, I, I think that curling photography is basically corona discharge, or what mediates or modulates the image, moisture, or the lack of it. So I don't subscribe to the notion that, that it's a way to monitor non-physical energies. I mean, that's my personal opinion. So you think that uh, what is picked up by curling photography is what? Um, it's, well, it's, it's basically high voltage, high frequency electrical energy that travels over the skin due to the skin effect, and it goes to ground, which is where the film is. And what m modulates the image is moisture or the lack of it. Mm -hmm. And anything that alters the physiology, emotion, whatever, will alter that image. There's no mystery about it. There was some great work conducted through the funding of DARPA at, at, at um, so a friend of mine did back in the uh, in Boston doesn't have diagnostic um... potential it has diagnostic potential but it's a meta it's a metastable phenomenon uh -huh. in the sense that um, it, there's too many variables affecting uh, the outcome to control and therefore it's it's never been adequately developed for that uh, reason okay i understand uh, west of the rockies you're on the air with dr taff hi hi uh, this is dan from the republic of fremont in como country yes sir uh, way up north way up north uh, dry it out. Um, I had uh, a couple thoughts. One is a correlation to uh, you'd mentioned some possibility of opening oneself through investigating these things to inviting these things to happen in your life or, uh, subsequently. Yes. And that reminded me of Malachi Martin's uh, replay uh, the other night. Yes. And a question was um, it came to mind that uh, he spoke, uh, Dr. Taft spoke of. Uh, possibly the telekinetic energy of the women in the entity uh, causing the apparitions. And um, I was wondering if he'd uh, thought of or investigated the possibility of uh, the telekinetic energy from her three children actually, uh, a la the, the vampire, psychic vampire discussions previously on Dreamland, sure. uh, coming into play there. All right. That's and an I'll, excellent question. I'll, I'll listen on the air. That, that's an excellent question, and I thank you for asking it. Um, uh, we assumed that the manifestation might have been caused by an interplay, psychokinetic interplay between Mrs. B and her three male children, as I implied, the implication of having three children and, and the volatile relationship and, and whatever, incestuous, you know, li, 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 uh, li, libido. All of that inter involved at a psychokinetic level theoretically could have produced such a manifestation. But again, that's almost as weird as saying an alien did it. So, I mean, but that's a, it, it's intriguing because you're one of the first people that's ever asked me that uh, in any talk show. So <laughs> I'm impressed by that question. All right. First time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. Taff. Where are you calling from, please? Hello there. I can barely hear you, sir. Uh, something wrong with your line. I'm sorry. Uh, wild card line. You're on the air. Whoops. Would have been west of the Rockies. You're on the air with Dr. Taff. Where are you calling from, please? This is Jake in Yakima. Hello, Jake. I thought maybe that cursed doll got you last night. Already. Yeah, maybe. Huh. Morning, Dr. Taft. Good morning. 
Um, I heard you talking earlier about doppelgangers. Right. I wonder if you'd heard the story of the German poet Goethe seeing his own doppelganger. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Uh, is there a lot of cases of actually seeing a physical manifestation of yourself? Oh, yeah. We had a case in 1992 in the Lincoln Heights area where they were seeing the the young child. Was The family saw the child when they knew where he was over to the left, and they saw him over to the right. And he wasn't cool. even home. They saw him running around. That's so, a doppelganger. The one you talked about before was on the phone, right? A, a girl with a, it was auditory. It wasn't visual. But, but there are some that are actual visual? Well, like I said, the one case we had in 92 in Lincoln Heights, they actually saw the child when he wasn't there. They, he was at school, he was miles away, yet they saw his apparition going around the house. Is there ever any interaction with the visual? Oh, yeah. They, sometimes they actually think it's the real child or the real person, and they don't even know it until it disappears on them. But when you were talking about the one where the girl was heard on the phone, right. you said that they, they spoke to her and she responded? Yeah, or, they spoke yeah. to her, heard her voice, she talked to them, she knew every de little detail about Is that her, kind about of, her uh, double blind. interaction with the visual, too? Yeah, that that's so mind-boggling. Uh, it, it seems to destroy so many theories that one might otherwise have about these kind of entities, uh, that it could interact that way is really chilling. Well, if it's an extension of the human psyche, um, it should possess all the, you know, capabilities at some level. It implies a consciousness, part. though, a consciousness of this, this separate, if it is separate, entity. Well, there have been out-of-body experiences where people have bilocated. Uh, they've been physical in two places at once, so I guess this might be an extension of that. A first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hi. Hi, this is Dave from Danville. Yes, sir. Listen, I'm, I'm calling, uh, be, I'm listening with total fascination. First of all, it's great to be on, on your show here talking to you, Art Bell. You're, you're doing a real service to people across the country. Thank you. any case, uh, uh, listening to Dr. Barry Taff and, and his case studies there uh, brought to mind an incident that happened back in 1974. I was a junior officer in the, in the Army uh, stationed at Fort Knox. And it kind of leads me to a question uh, to your to your guest there, and that is uh, in talking with a guy that lived next door to me in the officer quarters, mm -hmm. he was telling me about the paranormal activity that occurred at West Point, and it was really super fascinating, uh, and also quite frightening. Uh, the guy had indicated that uh, they were conducting seances and things at uh, West Point there, and. You know, the things that happen like uh, the windows would fly open and they hear loud uh, steps across the, the roof. Uh, in addition, there were things like activities like ghosts or apparitions that would appear in the cadet quarters that were well documented. Now, one could say, for example, that, well, this is this guy's account. But I went and talked to other cadets, graduates from the academy, and they had the same uh, explanations and same observations and, and knew of these things that were going on. And I was wondering, this leads me to the question to Dr. Taft, is uh, listening to your case studies, obviously you've picked up a lot of experience and that kind of stuff in, in the field of studying the paranormal. Mm -hmm. Have you taken that to places like West Point mm -hmm. and tried to use that to investigate activities there? All right. Well, uh, I have, I think I remember hearing something about what you just discussed, but We've never, if, unless we're invited out to the area to, to conduct an investigation, we just, you just can't go walking. You can't just go it. walking into West Point. In fact, sometimes they get very angry if you even attempt to do such. Well, let me tell you something. Um, the caller may be on to something, though, because I was in the Air Force, uh, one of the least strict um, services. However, at Lackland Air Force Base, I went through basic training. And what they attempt to do in basic training is to break you. In other words, they want to separate the wheat from the chaff, those who will uh, be able to stand up and those who will crumble. And inevitably, a lot of people crumble, and they are taken to the emotional edge of human endurance, psychologically. So it would not surprise me, with those kind of emotions being churned all the time, that there would be things that would occur at those basic training centers. Does that make sense? That and, and the opposite end of it as well, the discipline that goes in, developing a real good soldier at a military academy might enable or endow this, the individuals with enough force of mind to produce phenomena psychokinetically. Exactly. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hi. Hello. Uh, 
Hello, my name is Tom. I'm calling from Omaha. Hello, Tom. Yes, uh, I've had a lot of experience with photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only one picture I want to address is the uh, the one with the arc over the head. Right. Uh, I've seen that in the magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, that picture is so easily faked that I really can't say that that would be... You think it was fake? Uh, yeah. it, it's easily done. Except that we were there when the picture was taken. Uh, well... Uh, and we and you know we have the negative and it was examined by the right, West Coast editor right. of Popular Photography so it was out of our hands in terms of analysis and examination. Right. Uh, excuse me, doctor. It was examined by by who? The West Coast editor of Popular Photography, man, by the name Adrian yeah, Vance, to examined our negative. And and, and his uh, conclusion was he could find no explanation to account for those images. All right. Well, I can take a photograph and I can scan it and I could probably with work uh, fake as that caller pointed out. But but certainly not on the negative. And if if that was examined, then uh, not a fake. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, you were talking about the uh, barometric pressure with the eardrum thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's happened to me a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if that's just something that like I'm just going cuckoo, or that it's something that. Well, unless you're in an environment where there's other phenomena present, there's a number of reasons that can cause, you know, the eardrums or the station tube pressure changes, and it may have nothing to do with anything paranormal. Okay. All I'm saying is that in these environments, we seem to encounter it. So it may work in one direction, but not in another. Uh, where are you? I'm in Denver, Colorado. Den uh, everybody has experienced that, what you called overpressure. Um, but uh, going up and down hills, but not too much just sitting at home. Right. First time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hi. This is Brian from Boise. Hello, Brian. I'm wondering about the, uh, the alien hand syndrome. Do you know anything about that? The alien hand syndrome? Yes. I don't know anything about what you know, are you talking about. People claim their hand isn't their own and it sort of does things uncontrollably. It, when there's a disease... Right. I only know just very little about that, so I really can't comment. All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Uh, Taff. Hello. Yes, hi, Art. Hi, Dr. Taff. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, when I was younger, about four years old, I experienced um, a haunted house. Mm -hmm. My parents moved into an older two-story two, two home, and um, I lived with the uh, doors rattling. When somebody walking around upstairs when I was downstairs, and it really terrified me. And um, the it seemed to be attached to the ground because my parents built a brand new house next door, and um, hmm. the whole event seemed to move over there mm -hmm. to their new house. If it moves over to their new house, then it could be attached to the people, which would suggest it would be more psychokinetic. But without looking into the background of the property and doing profiles of the people, it's really hard to determine what the nature or source of it is. Doctor, are you still driven to investigate things? You said you still would, though you don't have funding for it. Well, we still investigate would. cases locally. If they're local in the Southern California area, we will do our best to get out and investigate them, especially if they're active. If they're other parts of the country, we just don't have the means to do it because you have to travel, you've got sure. to pay for your time, sure. the equipment, you know. Well, I meant on a personal level. Do you still feel driven to do this? Oh, yes. I mean, unquestionably, we, we seek case out. We seek cases out constantly. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Taff. Hi. How are you doing? How are you doing? I've got a comment about um, the Philadelphia experiment. Sure. Where are you? I'm in uh, Medina, Ohio, All right. south of Cleveland. Yes, sir. Um, I was, uh, about six years ago, I was bartending, and I met a guy. He came into bars on a Sunday afternoon. There was nobody there. And he was telling me about the Philadelphia experiment. His, he was in the service or worked for the government somehow, and he investigated it. I'm not exa exactly sure what he did, but he's telling me he saw pictures of the actual actual ship or whatever it was with the people fused to the, in, into the ship. He saw movies like... Uh, Eight millimeter film, I guess, of it, mm -hmm. of the actual people. Yes. Like after it happened. Yes. The ones that lived in in mental inst I guess they're in mental institution. He was saying for a while, and it was. I believed him the way. Just the conversation I had with him, it seemed like he was a pretty credible person, and 
that, that's pretty much my comment about it. Um, All right, sir. Uh, I appreciate your comment. Um, but there's not a lot that can be said. I've always wondered. I think something really did go on with the Philadelphia experiment. That's clear. But if that many people were injured or killed, you would think that there would be uh, uh, certainly records of some kind, although I guess our Pentagon can manipulate whatever they want and people are, can be reported killed in various ways. I, I just I don't know. And I'm sure you don't either, Doctor. Well, it's, like, it's like Roswell, the same thing. I mean, I'm sure there were records about what happened there, but they're mysteriously non-existent. Non-existent. Missing. Actually, right. there's a lot of records that were absolutely, uh, when um, a representative Schiff did the investigation, he found they had destroyed, I don't know how many records, of that, of only that particular period. But how convenient. How convenient. <laughs> Doctor, what a pleasure it has been to have you on the program. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. <laughs> and I suppose it's way past your bedtime. Yeah, it's a little late here. <laughs> All right. Dr. Taft, thank you. I'm sure we will continue to talk of this throughout the evening. We'll do it again sometime. Thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Take care. Right, Bye-bye. That's Dr. Barry Taft. And again, to get a copy of this program, three and a half hours, I guess it was, eh? It's a one 800 917 4278 beginning now. Desert and the great American Southwest. I bid you all good evening or good morning, as the case may be, across all these many sparkling time zones from the Hawaiian and Tahitian Island chains in the west, eastward, all the way across this great land to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands.